our common ethnicity and our shared experience of slavery and also of colonialism, the university recognized the need also to be looking forward. It happened that when this came into being, there was the global pandemic. And if ever there was any argument about the necessity and importance of it, that was amply demonstrated by what happened during the COVID pandemic. You will recall that for a very long time, the countries of Africa and the Caribbean were denied access to the treatment to deal with this global disease. And eventually, when they spared some of their excessive collection of pharmaceuticals to Africa, we in the Caribbean got a share of that. And there are two things from that experience alone. The first one is that we have to develop our own knowledge, our own expertise. And the second one is we have to stick together, particularly in dealing with the global problems which confront the world today. I mentioned slavery and colonialism. It should be necessary to elaborate on the plight which we have suffered from those two experiences. It's sufficient to say that we certainly are entitled to redress for reparative justice. And it also means that we as newly independent countries have to recognize that the global governance was not designed for the likes of us. In fact, it was done by the victorious powers after World War II when we were still colonies. And it therefore has to be one of our main objectives in being a voice for a reform of the global architecture. And the, between the 54 countries of Africa and the 14 countries of the Caribbean, we constitute just over a third of the membership of the United Nations. If we stick together, our voice will be compelling. And that has to extend to the financial institutions, such as the IMF and the World Bank, also in international organizations, the World Health Organization, the World Trade Organization, and even in UNESCO, where we are seeking to promote the links which exist and develop our cultural heritage for the benefit of our own people. And so we have embarked on a program of work that entails working on policy support for all the initiatives 
that are being undertaken by governments and public institutions in Africa and the Caribbean. There's no doubt that we are certainly related in no more ways than one. And we know that there is that very strong relationship and bond between both Africa and the Caribbean. You mentioned earlier the issue of reparative justice. Um, tell me how does the, um, the um, Institute um, play, what role does the Institute play in promoting reparative justice? As we know, CARICOM heads made a demand of 10 points for reparative justice. The lead responsibility for that is vested in a committee chaired by the Prime Minister of Barbados. And Sir Hilary Beckles is the head of the commission uh, that supports those efforts. We are presently at a point where the academic scholarship has been done. It's compelling. It is beginning to get some resonance in other parts of the world. Universities, both in North America and the United Kingdom, have recognized the need for redress. And a number of countries in Europe, uh, particularly the Netherlands, has made some step towards an apology, which is a minimum requirement. It's now at that point where we've got to convert the scholarship into meaningful action. In other words, advocacy is essential. And that has to be moving on all fronts. Uh, judicially, that's the subject of consideration by legal scholars and practitioners. In the United Nations, where we have recently seen the issue of a report by the Secretary General on the failure of the international community to address issues which arise from the Durban uh, Declaration. So the advocacy has to proceed um, at the governmental level through diplomacy. It has to be done very importantly with like-minded organizations, especially in, in Europe. And we have to build up a wall of demand which compels the governments who benefited from slavery to offer appropriate redress. So the Institute for Advocacy works alongside the Center for Reparations Research in a very active and cooperative fashion. You know, um, Pam Patterson, as we hear what you're talking about, we, 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 we also feel very strongly that advocacy must therefore translate into action. And we believe that um, the Institute, in partnership with the Center for Reparations Research, will keep that, um, that issue in the forefront because we don't want people to forget about it. And we are prepared to work with all other organizations and individuals who are prepared to support the CARICOM plan. Um, we talked about, we mentioned, you mentioned rather earlier, the issue of research and um, 
you could share with us a little bit of the type of research that you're thinking about that will be led by the Institute and the impact that we're hoping to achieve. In 2021, there was the first summit of leaders of the Caribbean and African nations. And together, they formulated a very detailed, elaborate, and comprehensive plan of action. For that to be implemented, policy studies will be necessary. They will cover such areas as climate change and global warming. They will deal with issues pertaining to health, to education, particularly in a time of technological revolution. We also need to look at the opportunities of trade between us. At the present time, trade between Africa and the Caribbean, when accumulated, only accounts for 3% of the global trade. Of course, to effect trade, we have the challenge of the transportation system. Uh, Marcus Garvey envisaged that many years ago with the concept of the Black Star Liner. Uh, in this age of aviation, we have to see what are the possibilities. We may have to start with charters in the first instance, and we also will, will have to look at the whole question of car movements of cargo. It's a bit of a chicken and egg situation, which one comes first. But our role is to assist in the policy studies um, being undertaken and anchored by the CARICOM Secretariat and the Secretariat in the African uh, Union. And to do that, we have a range of distinguished scholars, technical experts, and friends of the Institute who we can call on to assist us in undertaking the policy studies as may be required uh, by the secretariats. PM, this sounds like really excited work. Hard work, but excited work. Um, so far, the Institute was launched in 2020, and we are now in 2024, and we recognize the years of the pandemic. What are some of the events that the Institute um, has participated in? And are you pleased with the impact and the outcomes? Well, first of all, to some extent, we were limited by the restrictions of the pandemic. But also, the pandemic uh, forced us to recognize that we can use technology to achieve virtually what was not possible before. Uh, we have participated in various seminars and symposia, some organized by the University of the West Indies itself, others by institutions in the diaspora in which we have attended uh, we have been at the forefront of making sure that the Day for African Unity is celebrated in appropriate style. We have engaged in academic exchanges 
on topics, participated in dialogues organized by various uh, groups whose works and interests are part of what falls within our ambit. We are now looking forward in this year uh, to have a series of uh, podcasts and, of course, um, some symposia. One will be held in March. We'll be tackling two broad areas. The first session will be dealing with climate change and global warming and its threats and its impact to the countries of Africa and the Caribbean. And the second portion of that will be dealing with um, information and technological innovation. Uh, we have already identified um, cultural heritage as the next area um, for our concentration. You know, and that is very important to us as a people, wherever we are, our cultural, um, our, how, how we developed, what we built as, as peoples all over the world. That is important. And I know that you're, you're one of those that talk about, yes, we need policy and papers, but there's nothing like people-to-people -people exchanges as we go through this journey. And even more importantly, for young people, that's essential because it's obvious that we need to know about ourselves, what we have achieved, what are the, have been the impediments to our progress, the extent to which by deliberate effort the colonial powers have subjugated us to thinking and speaking in a certain way. And the resistance which we have given through our philosophers, through our painters, through our music to all, all of that. Um, there was a time when Drumming was banned for political meetings because the colonial powers thought that drumming was a way of sending subversive messages. That's no longer the case. And as uh, Marcus Garvey said and Bob Marley sang, we need to emancipate ourselves from mental slavery. We have to be engaged in freeing our minds because no one else can do it but we for ourselves. Thank you so much, Pierre. But I'm going to ask you to just divert a little bit. You had mentioned earlier the issue of distinguished scholars and fellows. Could you share with us um, how that program came about? Why it is so important to the Institute to have that cadre of intellectuals and creatives on board? Well, for, first of all, um, we have to operate in a situation where we receive no financial support from the university. So we have to use our ingenuity to secure the resources that are necessary. And essentially, there are financial resources which have to be provided. 
but most importantly, the human resources. And for the work that has to be done, we have to be able to find people with the knowledge who are prepared to be engaged and contribute of their expertise voluntarily without expectation of material reward but with the certainty of personal fulfillment and so we have available to us scholars of renown some of whom have retired from professorial duties and probably have now some more freedom with the use of their time others who are still actively in, engaged and have full access to the store of information which is necessary to undertake those tasks. We also have a group of experts and they cover um, trade, finance. Uh, we have authors as part of our um, group, persons who have written about the black experience, uh, who are helping us to find our footing as a people and who have helped to establish that those points of connectivity between Africa, the Caribbean, and the diaspora. We put very great emphasis on the diaspora, uh, remembering that it is the same ships that took our ancestors across from Europe. Some ended in the Caribbean, some were transferred um, to North America and South America as well. Um, to be candid, we have been dealing more directly so far with those in North America, but uh, we have a new research fellow who has come on board, uh, Professor Ramsey, uh, who specializes in Hispanic studies, and uh, we intend to expand the breadth of our activities, firstly beginning with the Caribbean littoral, um, Colombia, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and eventually, eventually, Brazil. I'm going to repeat again. These are in both interesting and exciting times for the Institute, yes, for the University of the West Indies. And when we think of the outcomes of what it is that um, the Advocacy Institute here is doing. The Distinguished Fellows Program is, um, is, I have not heard of anything as broad as this program before. And I just want to share quickly with our um, listeners um, and viewers rather that the program you, our listeners and viewers, will be hearing from some of the distinguished scholars during this program. They certainly will, as you indicated in your opening statement, we now will be doing these broadcasts on a monthly uh, basis. The Vice Chancellor has directed the university uh, TV 
to um, enable us to explain, to carry the message, uh, because we want an understanding by our Caribbean people and our African brothers and sisters what we all are about. And it's very, very important um, to get not only the academic community involved, but civic leaders as well. And in that regard, I would emphasize the role of our churches and our non-governmental organizations and um, Pan-African groups in general. We will work with whatever organization is committed to any portion of our terms of reference. You mentioned earlier about young people, and I know you're passionate about um, involving them in the process, what it is that um, is happening at the Institute. Um, I think I heard about some student groups. You want to expand on that a little yes. for us? It's still in the embryonic stage. Uh, for one, for one, we want to make sure that the guild of students on each campus understands, accepts, and support what we are about. It was many, many decades ago, but I remember being an officer of the guild, and I know any attempt to impose an idea or a structure on them without their consent is going to get a pushback. So we are in the course of moving from the Mona campus where I think one group has already been established to having other groups on other campuses. And uh, we have the clear understanding that though we are a UWI institution, we are not precluded. In fact, we are encouraged to work with uh, tertiary institutions that are external to the University of the West Indies. And we have already identified those with which we will move during this year. And we're looking forward to that. Again, I say exciting and interesting times. Um, before we leave, is there anything that you would like to add that you know you want to share with our viewers that um, we did not touch on initially? No, simply, I would like to say that um, as we go forward, unity of purpose and of action is an imperative. We live, I would say, in a hostile environment where, unfortunately, race has become increasingly a trigger point and not in a positive fashion. So we must be proud of who we are and we must work with all those who are committed to spreading a message that no matter our color, no matter our race, no matter our religious creed or political belief, we belong essentially 
to one race, and that's the human race. And we only have one planet on which we all must live in peace, in dignity. And the Institute will be working assiduously to contribute to that end. Thank you so much, PM Patterson, for your insight as we face the challenges as people of Africa and of African descent. It is clear that the Institute will continue to bring people and ideas together. The region will be exposed to the perspectives of our scholars as to how best we can bring our ethnic and familial ties to benefit us all. This program was produced by the Institute for Africa Caribbean Advocacy at the University of the West Indies. Thank you for joining us and I look forward to seeing you soon.
Um, Chief Abasanjo, uh, Dr. Carla Barnett, the Most Honorable uh, PJ Patterson, Professor Sir Kenneth Hall, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, Professor Anthony Bogues, and of course our panelists, who is uh, Professor Michael Taylor and Professor Akinola. Also, I'd like to acknowledge um, those from the Ambassadorial Corps, staff and students of the University of the West Indies, and distinguished ladies and gentlemen. So I hope you are all feeling recharged after your break, lots of coffee, fruit, and cake. <laughs> we like that. So uh, thank you. The session that we are uh, discussing um, for our first um, um, uh, session in this uh, symposium um, relates uh, to climate change. So I'm happy to represent the University of the West Indies. And for those of you who don't know who I am, I am Sandria Maynard, and I am the Pro Vice Chancellor for Global Affairs. And I'm happy to represent the University of West Indies at this very important event that not just links our regions, but our historical linked communities. And I'm also very pleased to see so many of our colleagues and internationally recognized academics, statesmen and women who are focused on strengthening cooperation by exploring opportunities between the Caribbean and African regions. Now, to embark on any engagement, especially one of this kind, it is important to understand the realities of our regions. And such an understanding would lay a strong foundation with purpose that would enable us to develop and, dev and design a revisioned approach to how we work and coexist so that we can help a new historical perspective that can be translated into meaningful, tangible impacts that leads to the betterment of humanity. Now, this first session, we're looking at climate change and mitigation strategies. And we would like to look at identifying opportunities for Africa and the Caribbean. And it is my pleasure this morning to be your moderator as well as I'm going to share with you a few words in relation to the activities that we are doing here at the University of the West Indies. Now, when recognizing the realities faced by Africa and the Caribbean in relation to climate change, it is extremely important to both regions um, and globally. Addressing adverse climatic changes as a collective is integral as it underscores the point, we simply cannot do this alone. We therefore must combine our academic research and our advocacy to firstly understand where we face similar challenges. And secondly, we need to work even more so um, to build the resilience of our region and the African continent. I would like to share a short uh, time to share with you the UE's role as we are leading on SDG 13. And many of you will be familiar with the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nation. And the UE is leading on that um, in relation to climate action. As we know, historically, our Caribbean region is not a stranger to natural disasters. However, in recent decades, these disasters have been so severe that in some cases, islands have, have lost all of their GDP within a mere matter of hours. The recovery plan for this simply did not exist in any textbook the magnitude of the loss goes beyond economics. The social post-disaster trauma is real, and we cannot 
account for this in any theoretical equation. Adverse climatic changes have increased exponentially. So as we see, the writing was clear and the alarms have been going off for a while now. And I would say that our clairvoyant climate change scientists have been vocal over many years, urging the international community to take notice before it is too late. Yes, we've heard of 1.5 to stay alive, a rhetoric that we are all too familiar with, now begun its echo right here at the UEMONA campus with the research of Professor Michael Taylor, who you will hear from shortly. Also, one of our previous professors, Professor John Agard at the St. Augustine's campus, and they have worked on building climate resilience through their international works and also their international contributions, and they cannot go um, unnoticed. They are but a few of our international academics who have continued to contribute their works to the international community and respective fora. The UE academics have been at the forefront of world-class research, resulting in contributions to publications and reports that I would say have been eye-opening, policy-changing, especially for governments and agencies and other stakeholders across the globe. Many of the UE scientists have served and continue to serve as contributing authors and review editors to reports by, for example, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the United Nations. And I'm just going to give you a little history just, and I'm going to skip, and I'm going to hit the salient points, as I should say, that, for example, in 2007, um, the, um, in relation to the IPCC, the UE professors um, Anthony Chen and a number of others, including John, uh, Professor John Agard, shared in the glory of the Nobel Peace Prize that was given jointly to the IPC and Al Gore Jr. for their work um, on the special report. Now, Prof. Michael Taylor, I, don't, I hope I'm not going to steal your thunder here, but um, he also um, was uh, one of the coordinating lead authors on the report um, in 2018 in relation to global warning, warming, the 1.5% I was just talking about. And it was specifically geared at summarizing global warming in respect for stakeholders, but more importantly, towards policymakers. Five other of our UE researchers also contributed to sections of that report. There were other reports produced in 2019 in relation to climate change and land, another IPCC special report. And of course, there was the State of the Caribbean Climate Report in 2020. And the United Nations Global Sustainable Development Report in 2018, Dr. Davis Smith, who is currently appointed as a member of the Science Policy Advisory Committee, um, prepared that report. So we, our academics, have been really at the forefront for many, many years. Now, let us consider the fact that globally, the planet's temperatures are gradually rising. Uh, 2000, uh, 2023 initially was noted as being the warmest year on record, statistically. This has now been eclipsed by January 2024, with the average temperature being recorded at 1.6 degrees above pre-industrial levels. So the past January being the warmest essentially means that the planet has breached that 1.5 degree benchmark. Thus far, there is no indication and no evidence to think that 2025 will be contrary. But instead, all evidence indicates that we are, more, we are likely to surpass our 2024 um, numbers unless significant action is taken. 
Now, we in the Caribbean region is at the front row seat, if I say, to this change. Our region produces the least amount of greenhouse gas emissions globally, but guess what? We are the ones that are significantly impacted by the changes um, with regards to the climate. Unfortunately, not being the author of these um, adverse climatic changes, we are effectively the victims. Now, climate action has, as I said, has been a long-standing priority for the university. And in 2019, the university was nominated as the SDG 13 cluster lead as part of the International Association of Universities. Now, that cluster is in relation to higher education and research across all of the sustainable development goals. And as you appreciate now that we've gone past the halfway mark and we are nowhere near being able to achieve those goals in time for 2030. So what we activate as part of this cluster is that we are looking to foster our relationships globally to understand the SDGs at a tertiary level in a multidisciplinary and international way. Now, what we hope to achieve from that is to generate new collaborative projects and other initiatives. And I would invite our colleagues, of course, in Africa to join as part of that, um, or those projects and that initiative. Now, the Global uh, University Consortium um, is led uh, by us, but of course, the university, this isn't the first initiative that we have done. Across the campuses, we have a number of research clusters and other centers that are dealing specifically with different elements of climate change. Um, so, for example, just to mention a couple, we've got the Center for Resource Management and Environmental Studies at uh, the Cave Hill campus. Um, we have um, other uh, centers. So, for example, I'd mention this because it's an online one, which is quite a good one to encourage those from the continent to join in, which is the Global Institute for Climate Smart and Resilient Development. And our actions do continue. More recently, certainly, we have prepared a draft climate action plan and a climate justice strategy at the end of 2023. And its intention is to create um, a document supported by a just and equitable approach to set a pathway towards decarbonization across all of our university campuses. Additionally, we have acknowledged that there are many higher education institutions across the Caribbean who are partaking in this area of research. So what we have uh, recently secured funding for is a geoinformatics system that is a knowledge platform that visualizes sustainable development goal projects across the region. And we hope that it would have a multi-layered data analytic platform to map the type of projects that are happening across the region. It will then give access um, to all so that we're not repeating each other's work. Because I think that that is a danger as well um, in the region. So we want to make sure that it is a regional repository of knowledge and that it is supported by other NGOs. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to impress upon our continents and regions, the importance of adaptation and mitigation. We will also assist in leading the way with advocacy and continue our training of our students and continue our research in relation to our sustainable development goals. Now, in order to be effective in adaptation and to some extent mitigation, our regions have recognized that a lot must be done in order to safeguard its citizens, economies, and livelihoods. And these can range from a varied yet similar history, culture, and ancestry. The end game, as I say, 
is, to be work, is for us to work collectively. I would like to take a page from the Honourable Mia Motley's um, book, if I say this, who has been exceptionally vocal um, in the region globally, encouraging other world leaders to take action. Um, most notably, and I mentioned this, the Bridgetown Initiative, um, which was a, a direct output of COP26, and it's aimed at creating an action plan to look at the global financial systems in aiding uh, the region when it comes to climate disasters. And as I noted earlier, the importance of raising these examples around climate change is that we may be small, but we are working to affect change in the right direction. So with your support and acceptance of our work, we will not only be able to foster new learning opportunities, but we will be able to amplify our voices internationally. Now, whilst our history is one linked to the darkest, to one of the darkest periods in the world, we simply cannot allow our future to be linked in this way. Our future must be drawn from the prowess of our leading world researchers and statesmen and women, who challenge the status quo because it does not fit our reality. So deepening our region's relationships will strengthen our ability to speak out, and I'm merely reiterating those sentiments that have already been offered by our um, speakers earlier today. So what I would say is this, my office at the Global Office of Global Affairs is no stranger uh, to this work and we will continue to align ourselves with the advocates um, to ensure that we can move forward in a positive way and we can have quality impact and resources to do that work. I would, in conclusion, like to thank uh, the Honourable Mr PJ Patterson and the Institute for Africa Caribbean Advocacy and it must be commended. It is a bridge that is linking our regions together. Having this institute with us plays a vital role in creating the opportunities to strengthen global advocacy and leading the charge of effectively representing Africa and the Caribbean diaspora relations into a fully envisioned global Africa. So on that note, I'd like to thank you for your time and before we move on, I'm going to, don't jump up quite yet, Prof, Prof Taylor, I'd like to introduce um, uh, to you, and I've kept the bios um, very, very short just for the purpose of this, so I'd like to introduce our first speaker, which is Professor Michael Taylor, who is a Professor of Climate Science and uh, the Dean of the Faculty of Science and Technology at our Mona campus. He is the co-director of the Climate Studies Group, which is a research body which explores climate variability and change for the Caribbean region. He is very well published and cited for his scientific work on the impact of climate change on the small islands of the Caribbean region. As I mentioned earlier, he had been the coordinating um, lead author on the special report for the IPCC and of course, he has gone on to do so many other excellent things. I think I should sum that up and I would like you all to give Professor Taylor a round of applause to welcome him. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Let me begin by simply acknowledging all the distinguished persons in the room and online. In fact, acknowledging everybody because you are all distinguished, both in the room and online. And just simply saying thank you very much for the invitation to make this presentation. I think as you have heard, I am a climate scientist. Usually at that point when I say I'm a climate scientist, there's a collective groan that goes across, goes, goes throughout the room. 
But what I want to do very in the few minutes that have been allotted to me is really make what I call a simple contextual presentation. And let me explain what I mean. I want to suggest that when you look on from the context of climate science, there, it is possible, or ask a question, is it possible to define a broad framework for this kind of cooperation that we are seeking between Caribbean and African states? So if I take the context of climate science, can I define a broad framework for moving forward with this cooperation between Africa and the Caribbean states? I want to suggest that I think we can from the context of climate science. Why? Um, because I think there are four what I would call shared climate challenges that emerge between the two regions when you look from the perspective of science. And those four shared climate challenges that emerge um, between African and Caribbean states or the two regions therefore provide a framework for this collaboration. And if I can, I'm successful in defining these four shared climate challenges, then I think those are the challenges from which we must view COP28, as you see in your program. COP28 is the conference of parties where all, all, the entire world meets. And we must view the relevance of COP28 from the perspective of those four shared climate challenges. So that's all I want to do in this very, very brief presentation. Offer for you these four what I think are shared climate challenges between our two regions, which I think can help us define a broad framework for collaboration. And if that's okay, then I will go ahead. Just before I offer you the first of those challenges, I do want to say one, I'm going to, when I talk about from the context of science, I'm going to pull on the science of the IPCC reports. Why the IPCC reports? Because it, it is actually a compendium of shared science. So there's science about our two regions. And it also has a lot of the science that our two regions have produced that have, we have, we have taken a lot of effort to build the science capacities within our regions. And they are in the report. I'm simply going to pull them out. So that is the science that I'm going to pull on. And the second kind of background context that I want you to hold in mind is this. You heard that the Caribbean region has always advocated for 1.5 to stay alive. Well, what is 1.5? 1.5 really means that by the end of the current century, we must not warm more than 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. Let me just put in there that we are already at 1.1 of those 1.5 degrees. Um, so that's what we have warmed already. So by the end of the current century, we must not warm by 0.4 more because that's the goal that the Caribbean and, and other small islands supported by other states have put on the table. But then you have seen headlines emerging last month that says, listen, as a region, or as a globe, sorry, we have breached 1.5. Now, what it means is that if you take the year from last February up to this January, and you do the global average for the very first time in, um, since the pre-industrial times, the globe has attained greater than 1.5 degrees. That's significant for us, because we are proposing it must not occur before the end of the century. That does not mean that as a globe we have collectively breached 1.5. We'd have to do that for several years and maintain it for us to make that kind of statement. But it does mean we are reaching a threshold much quicker than we had ever anticipated. Given that background, I want to say, listen, there are four shared climate challenges that we can pick out from the perspective of science, which allows us to provide this broad framework for collaboration. What are they? Well, the first one is what I call the challenge of the unprecedented becoming inescapable. So the first climate challenge that is shared between us is the challenge of the unprecedented becoming inescapable. All right, so what on earth do I mean by that? Well, the science will always throw up wonderful looking pictures like this. On the left, pulled from the IPCC reports, 
are for Africa, changes in temperature since 1980 to present. That's the, the one that's red, and the, the darker it becomes is the greater the change in temperature. And, uh, and beside it is the changes in rainfall, and you can see parts of it become dry, that's brown, parts of it become red. And it shows you that we have seen, at least for the continent, significant changes in temperature. And you can pull out several others of these kinds of pictures. The one on the right says, it's not only for the present. If we look on for the Caribbean now and go way into the future, if you look on that little brown in the middle, as we go in the Caribbean, going from present to the end of the century, all we do is dry. And we dry in the period May, June, July. And if you're from the Caribbean, you know that that's our rainy period. And so the science allows us to say, wait, we are seeing harsher climates now, and we can define those harsher climates in multiple ways that the science enables. Hotter, more variable rain, more extremes, extremes being very intense hurricanes or very intense droughts, higher sea levels. But the science also says we will continue to see those things as we go into the future. The science doesn't only give us pretty pictures, but it allows us narratives as well. So for again, I'm just pulling, pulling out from the science examples. So for example, for Africa, in the, 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 the region of Africa, it says, climate change has, has increased heat waves and drought on land and doubled the probability of marine heat waves around most of Africa. That's the no. For the future, it says, much of the, you know, most of the African countries will enter unprecedented high temperature climates earlier in this century than generally wealthier, higher latitude countries. You see similar kinds of statements for the Caribbean. So much, no, much of the Caribbean showed statistically significant warming up to 2010 with statistically significant increases in the number of warm days and warm nights. I think anybody sitting in this room can, can relate to that. And going into the future, it will continue to warm this century, um, consequent increased frequency of warm extremes for the Caribbean. What am I trying to argue? I'm trying to argue this. If you take the context of the science, two kinds of things emerge. One, we are already seeing the emergence of an unfamiliar, multi-hazard um, era marked by the intrusion of the unprecedented. So the unprecedented is already becoming a part of our reality. And it's multi-hazard because we're not seeing one or the other. We're seeing multiple things at the same time, heat extremes and sea level rise. But the science is also arguing, not only are we seeing the unprecedented intruding more and more now, but as we go into the future, the unprecedented is going to become entrenched. And so we are going to live in an era of the unprecedented. And this is true from the science for both regions. What is that shared climate change, climate um, challenge that we are seeing? It's the challenge of the unprecedented becoming inescapable. Just before I move on to the second one, what, so what if it does that? I'm just going to use a diagram from Jamaica to make a point. It's not just the magnitude of the event that is the problem, but it's the frequency of recurrence. So if you, could, you, know, if, if you can read the table, it's really a table of unprecedented events that have struck our little island country of Jamaica from 2000 to the present. And it makes a very telling statement. In 2000, we had a drought, and if you look on the far right column, it cost us 0.2% of our GDP. In 2001, we, we were brushed by Hurricane Michel, or the outer bands, and it cost us 0.7% of our GDP. In 2002, we then had May-June flood rains that cost us 0.6%. And we said, okay, we got away in 2003, but, by the, but Charlie and Ivan in 2004 made up for it. You know, and you see that Ivan was 6.8%. And you get the point that I am trying to make. It's not just the magnitude of the event, but the fact that every single year the unprecedented impinges on our lives, and we never have a chance to recover. First shared challenge that I think can define that framework is that we share the challenge of the unprecedented rapidly becoming inescapable. 
The second shared challenge then, and so there's a clearly a, a framework for cooperating around that climate, defining that unprecedented, that is becoming inescapable. But the second challenge that you see, if you're really going and looking at the science, is what I call the challenge um, of the untouched becoming imperiled. So the first one is the challenge of the climate, defining the climate science, so unprecedented becoming inescapable. The second is a challenge of the untouched becoming imperiled. What on earth am I talking about that I can hear you asking? The truth is, the science again throws up things like, you know, tables like this, which are hard to read, but let me just quickly explain that look on things that, like the impacts of climate change. And what is emerging in the science is once upon a time when we talked about climate change, we would talk about the impacts in terms of agriculture or just talk about it in terms of water. But now we are beginning to see a raft of impacts, things like water availability, mental health, species shift in range, et cetera, et cetera. A diagram like this tells us the two little bands that you see, the one on the outer band is for small islands and the other one is for Africa, that there is a shared challenge of greater and greater parts of our, our life, whether natural or, or human life, um, that are becoming impacted by climate change. And, and what's interesting about these, wherever it's red, it shows that there's an adverse impact for that category. But if it's red and hatched, it says it's, you can have positive. There are no positive impacts on the Africa and, and, and Caribbean in, for this particular diagram. But then the narrative of the science shows up other things. Things like poverty and disadvantage are going to increase when we hit global warming of 1.5. And, and get further increase when we hit global warming of two. The point that I think I'm trying to make is that as we continue on the climate change, one of the shared challenges we are facing is not just an expansion of the already vulnerable, but the emergence of new climate vulnerable as well. Things and um, persons who we had not previously anticipated being climate vulnerable. In fact, just to end this point, I've been making a list of what. So it's the expansion of the already climate vulnerable and the creation of new climate vulnerable. And the way you want to look at this is then, therefore, the very people who you would want to be benefiting from development are the very people who climate is denying de de development benefits. And that's a shared challenge. And you know, I, just to leave this point, I've been defining what I call a Taylor list of new climate vulnerable. <laughs> vulnerable. And how I've been doing it is just go to the newspaper headlines, and any time the headline gives me a climate um, thing. And, and it's interesting to see who are among the new climate vulnerable in our society. So it's the poor, the elderly, the children, the health challenge, the physically challenged. For both societies, it's all the outdoor workers in extreme, in extreme climate. But it's also our cultural assets and our cultural identity and, 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 our, and our knowledge and you know, small business owners and, and homeowners for whom insurance risk, um, rates are now going up. These are the new climate vulnerable. But you get the point that I'm making. There's a second shared challenge, which I think can come within our framework for collaboration. The first is clearly that the unprecedented is becoming inescapable. But the second is that the untouched are now becoming imperiled. And there's a framework for working together around vulnerability. Very quickly, there is a third shared climate challenge that I think, you know, can be slotted into this framework. And it is what I would call the challenge of the utopian that is now becoming improbable. What on earth do I mean again? The truth is, for a long time we have looked on climate change in terms of its impact on you know, humans or, or a particular system, on species. 
But we're beginning to see from the science emerge in looking on climate change across themes. So looking on climate change across water security or food availability or cities or health and well-being. And the reason why you have to do this is because those previous impacts that I described are now become doing what we call cascading and compounding. So you get an impact on water, but the impact on water is not limited there. It spreads you now to education and health and agriculture and eventually the ability for cities to sustain themselves, etc. And when you get this cascading and compounding impact, now you begin to affect these holistic themes around which society must live. You can see it in the narrative, and I just chose two interesting ones, and there are several. In the IPCC report, it talks about climate change undermining educational attainment in Africa, and it goes on to define how the compounding impacts and cascading does that. That's climate change and education. In the Caribbean, in the same IPCC, it talks about how small islands face disproportionate health risks. Where are the health risks? The food security problems, the water problems, the inaccessible, inaccessibility of getting health, health care. And you begin to see these compound and cascading risks. The real point I'm making, and I'm almost finished, is this. When you begin to look at it, uh, when you begin to look at it in that framework, what we're doing is threatening our sustainable development goals. And the goals that we as regions have de defined for us to reach by 2030 are, are under threat. And so we, we have a shared challenge about the, those utopia and those ideals becoming improbable and not being able to achieve them. The last one, I have a minute left. <laughs> okay. <laughs> The last one, I'm saying there's a framework we can define, um, shared climate challenges, a framework around the unprecedented becoming inescapable, a framework around the untouched becoming imperiled, a framework, a common framework, a common shared challenge around the utopian becoming improbable. And the last one you could have guessed is a common shared challenge around the urgent becoming immediate. And the point I'm making is that we know a range of development pathway actions that we need to be taking. So you heard about it already. We need to be pursuing a strong mitigation agenda. That's the only way we can keep the temperatures down to 1.5. And that must involve things like renewable energy and dealing with waste and, and dealing with our forestry and the blue economy, et cetera. And so, but no longer must we see mitigation as an option to pursue. It has now become a demand. And similarly, we know that adaptation has to be the, the, the pursued and it has to be across all areas of life. It's no longer an option, but a demand. And then I hope we'll get to talk about the other things, the scaled up research and technology agenda because responding to climate change has to be contextual. You can have the same climate change in the region, but it impacts Haiti different from how it impacts Jamaica. And of course, pursuing a structured education agenda, a deliberately collaborative agenda, that's where we are. A global climate finance agenda, because we have to finance these things. In other words, development options are not options anymore, but they are demands. And so I end with this last slide, which is really to say, that's where you must fit COP28 in. COP28 produced what is called the UAE consensus. And in that consensus, it commits the world to a couple of things. If those couple of things do not match that shared urgent development agenda, then COP28 loses its relevance for us. So things like the global stock take in COP28, which is now the first time we're seeing how, if we are on track, becomes critical. Things like the transition from fossil fuels, which is listed there, becomes critical. The roadmap to mission 1.5 becomes critical. The loss and damage fund becomes critical. And we can go through all of these, the transboundary impacts of climate. So. Sorry to have stayed too long. Where am I? 
there are four shared challenges, I think, between our regions. And those four shared challenges help us to define this collaborative approach that we're looking on. They are as listed. They are important because clearly, when the unprecedented becomes inescapable, development trajectories are disrupted. When the untouched becomes in peril, development benefits are denied. When the utopian becomes improbable, development goals are delayed. And when the urgent becomes immediate, development options become demands. We share a, a common goal, which is turning COP28 commitments into meaningful actions. And there's therefore this clear role for collaboration on a science agenda around these challenges. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof Taylor. Um, it's given us a lot of food for thought. Um, I will certainly say that, and you clearly identified that roadmap, that framework that we need to look at. Um, I'm sure there'll be many questions for you when we get to our Q&A session. So what I'm going to ask now is for our next speaker, and I'm just going to briefly introduce um, our next speaker, which is Professor Akinola. And uh, Prof Akinola is the Head of Research and Teaching at the Institute for Pan-African Thought and Conversation and the Institute for Global African Affairs at the University of Johannesburg in South Africa. Uh, and I'm going to shorten this to say that he's also a visiting professor at the United Nations University for Peace Africa program in Addis Ababa. He specializes in African political economy and African Union studies, migration, conflict, and peace studies. Um, he is a established um, author and um, a co-editor of the Pan-African Conversation, an international journal. He has uh, a number of uh, book publications, and he specializes particularly in the political economy, African Union studies, migration, peace, and security. And I understand, uh, thank you so much, that um, our colleague, um, Professor Akinola, is joining us online. Thank you very much. Can we welcome him in the normal way? Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And um, I wish that you would kindly permit me to stand on existing protocols and appreciate the opportunity to be part of this uh, stimulating night. And I will also greet your indulgence by allowing me to present and to have this become a climate mitigation and residence. And I wish to talk about this campaign's problem. From the global north to the global south, human activities have continued to hit the atmosphere, ocean, and land, attracting dire social, economic, and health consequences, as well as threatening lives and ecosystems and causing widespread loss and damage. South Africa is one of the most industrial economies in Africa and ranked 96 out of 182 countries on climate change vulnerability and rising temperature. The country continues to experience greater climate variability, primarily because of its subtropical positioning and the surrounding presence of oceans on three sides of the country. It contributes over one third of the total energy related carbon dioxide on the continent. Climate change already seen a 1.2 OC rise over the years, and South African experiences average annual temperature of 17 OC. Without urgent action, South Africa's time lose 5.03% of its GDP by 2050, which may even increase to 13.5% by 100. The average rainfall of 450 millimeters per year in the country is well below the world average 60 millimeters. Indeed, almost 80% of the country land surface is regarded as semi-arid, with only 10% categorized as dry. Based on John Ngamba's report last year, it revealed eight climate changes 
which I will quickly uh, run through. The first is just that South Africa is warming at twice the global rate. Only it records the highest level of carbon emissions on the continent. Climate change, often simplified as global, has consequences beyond global warming. Extreme weather events reason human in this climate change natural disasters. The fifth, economic impacts of climate change are including affecting livelihoods and causing societal impacts, which are negative. Number six, the burning of, for example, plastics are the primary cause of current climate change in the country. Why climate change contributes to rural urban life in Africa? And South African cities, particularly Durban and Cape, are vulnerable to climate change in their coastal and river applications. What are the realities of climate in the country? Beyond the nice sequences of climate change, driven by continuous rises in carbon side emissions and the rise of sea levels, paint a very stark reality in this country. Hot and cold extremes have also intense rainfall patterns have shifted and grown more erratic and heat will become more frequent while dry spells persist longer. What about agricultural activity? There have been a decrease in productivity in the agricultural sector, leading to more free losses in livestock and production of food insecurity. At least 3.4% of South Africans are currently food insecure. <clears throat> the contribution of agriculture to GDP declined from 5% in 2000 to 2.1% in 2018, while agricultural land reduced from 14,197 hectares in 2000 to 12,413,000 sorry hectares in 2018 because of the rising of the sea level cutting off of some land by the sea. Concurrently, vector and waterborne diseases are on the rise in frequency and impact. And if we have to use statistics between 1980 and 2023 last year, the country experienced 89 weather-related disasters impacting over 22 million people uh, in the country. And also, losses exceeded 113 billion South African rands. And in the past, the country has the six hottest years recorded in their history, as well as multi-year drought, floods, and marine heat waves along the coast. As the temperature hit 40 degrees Celsius in January last year, heat waves killed at least eight people. And also, even if you want to look at 2018 in Cape Town, the city experienced an unprecedented water crisis, while Johannesburg currently is experiencing uh, water shortages across the board. Flood affected all cities in the first half of 2021, wise flooding in, in April 2022 in KwaZulu Natal province, seen more than 400 fatalities, with more than 12,000 homes destroyed, over and over 40,000 people were displaced. Even in January this year, a storm and flooding in two provinces in destroyed around 1,220 households, affected 6,408 uh, mostly poor people, and claimed the loss of 44 people. This caused the urgent need to come to, to, for comprehensive climate action and mitigation. Additionally, due to habitat loss and degradation, 14% of plants, 17% of mammals, and 15% of birds in the country are currently threatened with extinction. The cost of climate change in South Africa is more and significant, affecting various sectors of the economy and the well-being of citizens. The following section bear most cause and consequences.
consequences of change in the country, talking about agriculture, water resources, health and well-being, energy, and what about that mitigation and resilience in the country? Transitioning to renewable energy sources to meet climate change involves, which is associated with infrastructure and technology de uh, deployment. South Africa climate agenda spans adaptation and mitigation efforts, and the president recently established the Asia Climate Commission to conduct independent analysis into climate change impacts on jobs, the economic and policy, as well as achieve zero mitigation pathways for each sector of the South African economy. Other key actions also include implementing a low emissions development strategy, a national climate change adaptation strategy, establishing a just transition framework, and implement a task. And the task was actually the first South African became the first African country to impose what we call the polluter pay table task, which is about 90% of the country's total emissions with only the exclusion of agriculture, forestry, land use, and waste. Efforts also focus on climate resilient agriculture and develop flood forecast warning system to enhance community resilience to past. However, warnings do not translate to early action in most in, in the country. But in collaboration with, the, with USAID under the Power Africa Initiative, Africa aims to transition its power sector to 42% non fossil sources by 2030. And Paris Agreement goes to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. This has attracted approximately four billion US dollars in investment in a bid to add 2,200 megawatts of fiber energy generation through this partnership. Additionally, projects are even under cut greenhouse gas emissions by nearly 860 thousand metric tons by 2030. And the government has also set its 2025 and 2030 mitigation targets around these critical sectors, namely energy waste in processes, product use, agriculture, and land use. The next government effort was tying its policies with the Paris Agreement, progress in resilience building as tall at the stage of policy formulation. And for instance, the government have been toying with the idea of deregulating South Africa's electricity company, ESCOM, but this has yet to materialize. There's also the climate change bill proposed in 2022 has also uh, yet to be despite its approval by the National Assembly last year. The majority of reported responses primarily focus on individual households, typically involving attitudinal, attitudinal adjustments at the family level. The government understands the need to prioritize low emissions to achieve the 1.5 OC target and combat climate, which increases the atmospheric temperature across the country. As the leading emitter of greenhouse gases in Africa and among the world's top 25 greenhouse gas emitting countries, nearly 90% of its energy and electricity supply originates from coal. ESCOM makes a 44 contribution to South Africa's carbon emission and is surprisingly 25% more carbon intensive than even China does. The country should deregulate the energy and electricity sector. Uh, and even if you want to talk about the plastic pollution, the government of Africa must be a policy to reduce the use of single-use plastic and other plastic bars oil. And from the plastic life cycle constituted 3.8% total global emissions. Only about 9% of plastic has been recycled since the 1950s. Therefore, the government should insist on the use of refillable beverage bottles across the country. 
the major drivers of risk to coastal infrastructure from erosion and flooding are waves, tides, and future sea level rise. And apart from the low structures and lines, flooding poses a threat to public spread of waterborne diseases. There are no currently effective system policies and response manage excessive rain in the country. What about uninterrupted electricity, which is very vital as heat waves since in the country, at least for now, and the cold electricity then strain over the years, leading to outages and power rationing, which is properly, proper, uh, popularly trading in, in the country. Currently, about a percent of Africans have no access to electricity. The civil society has the gift of the givers in the, have been working in partnership with states for climate resilience and adaptation in affected communities. While the government needs to involve the private sector, the government also closely monitor the private pollution shops. Climate change literacy is very poor in South Africa. 29th out of 33 countries surveyed in Africa, only 28% of South Africa have heard of human caused climate change, and the government must build a strong climate change knowledge and market to sensitize the population to buy buy-ins for current mitigation policies. That in the same way COVID-19 was securitized and declared an emergency, the government should declare a climate emergency in South Africa. And financing is very pricey. Only step of climate change financing is directed at climate change. However, climate mitigation is global responsibility, as we know. While we should implement pragmatic climate-friendly policy, states should continue to demand climate sensitivity and climate reparation global powers. And as South Africa continues to look inward for resilience, it can use its connection with our countries, its membership in other forms such as it, and brings to partnership to solve what has become a problem not only in Africa, but the world. And what we do is through knowledge sharing and learning by doing. Uh, thank you very much. I think I will rest. That's it. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Akinola. Much appreciated and um, certainly raises another number of issues to consider. Uh, we have similar challenges uh, across um, both the continent and the region. And of course, it, it's interesting to see that the financing element um, is a considerable factor here. I, I see that we have uh, Dr. Um, Carla Barnett joining us on screen, so welcome. And be before I ask uh, Dr. Barnett to uh, begin uh, giving us her presentation, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Barnett, um, who became the eighth Secretary General of the Caribbean Community, CARICOM, um, in August of 2021. Um, Dr. Barnett is an economist, and she brings over 30 years of professional experience in the region uh, to the post that she holds, including having served as Deputy Secretary General to CARICOM Secretariat, Deputy Governor, uh, Central Bank of Belize, uh, Financial Secretary, um, Government of Belize, and Vice President, uh, Operations Caribbean Development Bank, uh, blazing a trail as the first woman appointed to these positions. Um, her multifaceted career also includes appointments as Senator and Minister of State in the Government of, of Belize, um, and she's a member of uh, Sea Will Belize Chapter, past President, Belize Y, uh, WCA, and board member of Haven House. And of course, uh, Dr. Barnett has received several awards, including Commander of the British Empire. So please do welcome Dr. Barnett. Thank you very much.
Uh, Dr. Barnett, could I ask you to unmute and start again? Sorry, we can't hear you here. Thank you. Are you now? We are hearing you now. Thank you. Oh, okay. Right. Thank you very much, PVC Maynard, and um, thanks as well to my fellow panelists, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I thank the most honorable PJ Pata, statesman in residence, for this initiative which provides an excellent forum for the exchange of ideas and experiences on string cooperation in suits of development and prosperity of the Caribbean and Africa. It is my pleasure to present along with the distinguished members of this panel, Professor Taylor and Akinola on the issue of climate change mitigation strategy, climate change adaptation and the agenda item at the highest level of the Caribbean community in the meetings of the Conference of Heads of Government. Sustainable development, including environment and disaster management, and water portfolio assignment in the CARICOM with the lead head being the Honorable Prime Minister of St. Lucia. Governments of the region have begun to take steps to reduce emissions and get to a global solution. You therefore see a blend of mitigation and adaptation strategies in the determined contributions of our member states, stating how they intend to reduce emissions over a five year period. This is notwithstanding that, while the Caribbean as a whole contributes legitimately to global emissions that accelerate change, we, along with the rest of the developing world, are the brunt of the impact of climate change. We engage in the cyclical process of creating what for many of us is survival in the context of the United Nations Framework Convention on Change that should be needing to reduce global emissions. During annual cyclical negotiations, we seek to ensure a circular flow of information from the officers to ministers of government who then back with policy guidance and direction. This recognizes matters of climate change, mitigation, and adaptation, access to funding to address the challenges we face, and the effectiveness of the commitments to reduce emissions by the Global North, which group of countries is responsible for the proportion of the emissions that drive climate change. Climate negotiations in general are at this stage determined primarily matters of policy and diplomacy and not necessarily as a matter of science. In this process of articulating policy and agreeing positions in the global negotiations that surround climate change, greater collaboration and coordination between Africa and the Caribbean can make a world of difference to both regions. Despite the lethargy of global action, CARICOM is committed to climate resilience as a crucial developmental imperative our efforts will be advanced in May when Antigua and Barbuda will host the fourth International Conference on Small Island and Low Lying Coastal Developing States, SIDS, from which the expected outcome is a new 10 year plan of action for SIDS that is agreed between the SIDS and international partners. We are in a battle that will require the active engagement of our best minds and extensive participation including from civil society and beyond, from the Caribbean, Africa, and beyond. There is already a fund of cooperation between Africa and CARICOM. At the first Africa CARICOM Summit in 2021, both sides engaged on common challenges and opportunities and discussed critical global issues. These included the impacts of climate change and the need for urgent global action and financing to support adaptation and mitigation investments in the developing world. We reaffirmed commitments to pursue efforts to limit the temperatures to 1.5 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial levels as called for in the Paris Agreement. CARICOM and Africa already have a record of cooperation as demonstrated during the COVID-19 pandemic when the Africa Medical Advice Platform provided much needed assistance to CARICOM countries to access vaccines. The opening of the Afrexim Bank office in, in Barbados to drive trade and investment between Africa and CARICOM 
will hopefully lead to investments in renewables, smart technologies, and in other areas. At the policy level, CARICOM has traditionally had a strong voice in the Alliance of Small Island States, AOSIS, which also counts African countries among its members. We look forward to coordinating with our partners so we can more effectively pursue efforts in the global space to address the central threat climate change poses to our regions and our planet. Two things that we can do better at this time, and I'm limiting myself just to two at this time because there are many more. One is pursuing transition to renewable energy and energy efficiency. And the other is leveraging natural assets or forests and our seas to balance the global carbon footprint. Like most developing and largely post-colonial countries, we in the Caribbean are faced with heavy dependence on costly imported oil, aging, power infrastructure, and vulnerable electrical grids. We are all vulnerable to fluctuations in both prices and supply within the global oil markets, which exacerbate the region's energy secure insecurity and susceptibility to the impacts of climate change. Renewable energy and energy efficiency is a cornerstone for building resilience in our region. We do this primarily to provide secure and sustainable supplies of energy and minimize energy waste across all sectors. We are implementing projects to transition to low carbon and green and climate resilient energy sources, whether solar, wind, hydro, geothermal, green hydrogen in various CARICOM countries. The transition, the transformation of the energy sector is supported through CARICOM energy policy and the Caribbean Sustainable Energy Roadmap and Strategy. Estimates of what is needed to upgrade the region's power sector with modern, efficient, alternative energy options and increase generation capacity are north of US $11 billion. We need to add to that the investment necessary to modernize the power grids to reduce energy loss and increase disaster resilience. The reality is that much of the technology we need has to be sourced from the global north and access to technology is difficult, even if we are able to meet the high cost. Efforts to build energy security is also on the way in Africa, and there is great opportunity to share knowledge and work together to support advances in transitions to renewables. The second mitigation strategy I want to identify is the great potential for leveraging nature, balance the carbon footprint by the removal of carbon from the atmosphere. CARICOM heads of government have placed renewed focus on advocacy to include forests, nature-based solutions, and blue carbon into market mechanisms. New sources of finance for resilient development of the region are possible through existing forest conservation programs and carbon credit schemes. But there is a clear need for clarity of purpose as well as transparent accounting and reporting systems. In particular, in the absence of effective commitment by all to transparency of process, we run the risk of being once again marginalized in an evolving system that could be helpful to developing states, but also likely not be helpful if we do not work more effectively together. The potential for all developing states to combine conservation goals carbon sequestration and development financing through blue carbon and blue, carb and blue bond initiatives in both private markets and bilateral arrangements requires coordination and collaboration among all of us. There is what can be done together if we sit together, work together, negotiate together, and stand strong together. The Caribbean has been at the forefront of increasingly frequent climate-related disasters. In the 2017 hurricane season, for example, we had a record-breaking number of five storms and hurricane names that have been retired because of the death and destruction they left in their path. We have strong institutions, such as the University of the West Indies, the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center, and the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency, and others, which coordinate scientific research technical support, 
and disaster response in our region. We, Africa and the Caribbean, well within common strategic priorities for Caribbean institutions and African institutions to continue to build strong relationships to share knowledge and experience as we seek to stay alive, develop and prosper, even as the unfair and unequal impact of climate change advances upon us. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, there's a lot of work that has begun and there's a lot that we need to do together in the mutual interests of the Caribbean and Africa. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Barnett. Um, inspiring words, and I think that we can say that coordination is definitely the key here. We need to keep the conversation going, and as the Honourable Mrs. Patterson has put this symposium forward to make sure that the advocacy continues, what we have to do then is work together in research, um, and I know that we have Prof Taylor and Prof Akinola certainly that can uh, push forward in that respect. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. We've come to the end of our session, and I'm just conscious of, of time, and I know that uh, Sharon's going to... Sorry, we do indeed. I was going to say that we have a short moment, so if anybody would like to ask any questions, um, I would ask you to come to the microphone uh, just there. Yes, um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for your excellent presentation. Right, excellent presentations. Um, and as our honorable former prime minister has called us today to face the challenges, and one of the challenges for the ordinary Jamaican is closing the gap. Climate mm. change is up there, it's global, mm -hmm. and we are here, right? So, so one of the things we want to do is to how do we close the gap? The focus has been um, seems to have been on the mitigation strategies, the 1.5, which are pretty good. Um, the challenge that we envision is the corrective strategies. Um, is there a time now for a greater need of the loss and damage fund? What are the strategies and tactics for our farmers, our farming and agricultural strategies um, for our, for our technocrats, the housing development requirements, um, for the water availability strategies, the town planning strategies, what are the strategies to close the gap um, for the corrective measures? Thank you very much for your question. I'm going to, I'm not sure if we've got those online, but I'm going to invite Prof uh, Taylor uh, to respond. It's on? Okay. Bearing in mind that I'm a climate scientist, right? um, but you're right. Um, I think what you are, are articulating is that very often at the, what I would call the, the, the ground level, the common man, they don't, they, they, they don't see the impacts of climate change. And one of the first things I would suggest about closing the gap is also we clearly have to deal with education, climate change education mm -hmm. from the child, from children coming up. Because you know, when I was making my point, I was arguing that the vulnerabilities, sometimes you only see them in one respect. It's a farm or it's a, you know, but in truth, you know, I look on last summer in Jamaica, which was extremely hot, and, and you talk about the whole education sector and you talk about children who were sitting exams in, in ill-constructed, well, not, not ill-constructed, clearly not constructed for the kind of environment we have. So first of all, it's, it's education so that people can realize the impact, the, their vulnerability, and that they fall within that. But I think the second part of your question that you are reaching after is, if, for example, we do get a loss and damage fund properly set up so that it, it flows to government, how do you get that then? Once people realize, how do you get that trickling down so that the people who know are the most vulnerable feel that? And there are multiple strategies we're going to have to use to deal with. We have to deal with things like social protection strategies. We must see them as part of the climate change 
um, strategies. We have to deal with the influx of technology and getting people access to those kinds of things. So there are going to have to be a range and a raft of, of strategies to deal with that closing of the gap from policy to technical to education.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the second session of today's symposium, the P.J. Patterson Institute for Africa Caribbean Advocacy Conference Symposium on Strengthening Relations, Strengthening Cooperation Between African and Caribbean States. I'd like to make a statement on information technology, education, and innovation. Information systems is a vast set of integrated components that collect, store, process data, provides knowledge, information, and digital products. We are all in awe of how this has changed society and affects our lives perhaps complicating it for some, but overall has brought tremendous benefits to businesses, industries, and technical innovations in all fields that are empowering people, you, me, humanity in general, in innumerable and creative ways. This panel will focus on one component of this massive information system, information technology or information and communication technology. This aspect of information systems includes hardware, software, and telecommunications, one huge component of a very massive information system. In the field of education, IT or ICT, has been recognized and embraced for its potential to provide enthusiasm and opportunities to be innovative and creative. At all levels of the educational system, educators have embraced research that indicates that IT can modify approaches to the delivery of content and inspire pedagogical experimentations. Many educators and educational administrators who are constantly seeking new and innovative ways to appeal to students who, for the most part, are digital natives and are little motivated by charts, whiteboards, markers, and sometimes monotonous lectures, happily embrace the technology. However, there are still many in the field of education who, for various reasons, have not been able to access and use information technology in their classrooms. Advocacy must begin by addressing questions of making IT available to all people in the Caribbean and Africa, especially for educational situations and teaching learning contexts. It is important to underscore that despite the dynamism and innovativeness of information technology, the best way to utilize it in its many permutations to improve educational outcomes is to combine it with appropriate pedagogical approaches and theories. In the area of foreign languages teaching, for instance, and other areas of the humanities and education, and some areas of the social sciences, the theory of social constructivism, as proposed by Vygotsky, the theory is the theoretical frame that is best suited for supporting the integration of IT in teaching. This is because constructivism promotes active learning and student involvement, which are necessary in influencing students' attitudes and motivating them to take ownership of their own learning. I have had the privilege of supervising several graduate students who have conducted different types of research, case studies, action research, and conceptual research, which have corroborated the many ways in which the use of IT can enhance the FLT classroom. Much of the research on the integration of IT in FLT education can also be applied to several other disciplines. 
This integration has included computer-assisted teaching, a wide range of online resources, the internet, among others. The result has been the boost that the technology adds to teachers' credibility and versatility. IT provides teachers with immediate access to many resources which help to enhance the presentation of material that might otherwise be unappealing because they allow the creation of virtual environments for students to explore using live streaming, games, multimedia projects, and other interactive activities. Personal experience, as well as discussions with other educators and observation of persons who use IT tools in their teaching have underlined the extent to which this advances independent learning because the components of IT, especially the internet, provide such a vast pool of resources. Students can be organized to do their own searches on topics at different levels, to make their own discoveries, Game-based approaches are especially effective as they motivate students' interest and full involvement. One engaging approach to the integration of IT is blended learning, which is become in, becoming increasingly more favored, particularly at the tertiary level. Here at the UWI, blended learning is now frequently used, especially following the use of online delivery to meet the COVID-19 emergency teaching. Many persons now opt for an approach which allows for full delivery via IT in some classes and face-to-face -face sessions for other classes in the same course. This allows for versatility and flexibility in covering a curriculum and eases the monotony of face-to-face -face teaching, which can often be more teacher-centered. Online sessions allow students to become more involved in the learning process and to develop autonomy in making learning choices. The field of translation has been greatly aided by the use of IT or ICT. The teaching of translation now includes the use of what we refer to as CAT, computer-assisted translation. And communication between speakers of different languages has been greatly facilitated by programs that perform renderings of one language to the other. These are becoming increasingly more predominant in the field of translating and interpretation. Outside of the delivery of classroom content, information technology is useful and salient for helping students to develop technology literacy, as well as to learn how to be responsible users of online or digital sources. Students are provided the opportunity to acquire important skills that will help them to negotiate different aspects for living in the 21st century. A number of UNESCO reports and Internet Society studies on trends in the integration of IT tech in, in Africa and the Caribbean have highlighted that while there have been improvements in a number of sub-Saharan African countries and Caribbean countries, there are still several factors that need to be given attention. The internet is highlighted as being underused despite its ability to provide unparalleled access to information, virtual labs, ideas, and people. The main concern is that access to the internet is not equitably distributed across the world, with the African region lagging behind in bringing connectivity to schools, colleges, and out-of-school learners. In the case of the Caribbean, some countries have been more successful than others in improving connectivity in schools. But in general, there are two main problems that these small states face. The lack of training of teachers to use the technology and lack of connectivity. Even though Jamaica has an established policy document on the use of IT, in the educational system. This is mainly being integrated in the secondary schools with very little usage at the primary level. 
and with the majority of Jamaican teachers not being trained to use the technology. St. Kitts has been highlighted for its contradictory position in which there is a 100% connectivity to broadband in the primary schools, but less than 5% of the teachers are trained to use the technology. In both the Caribbean and Africa, advocacy is key to overcoming these challenges. Stakeholders and wealthy philanthropists need to divert their attention from other supposedly well-meaning projects to champion initiatives for improved internet connectivity in schools and in communities in general. Despite the abundance of cell phones in almost all the communities in Jamaica and in many, many, many communities across Africa, the evidence is that this aspect of the technology has not been adequately harnessed for educational advancement. ICT can empower all advocacy efforts. Social media platforms enable organizations to connect with the wide audiences, raise awareness about critical issues, and mobilize communities for action. However, in today's world, which, in which so much emphasis is placed on globalization, there needs to be a caveat. While it is fair to say that IT has been a major tool in the efforts to advance globalization agendas, caution must be exercised to ensure that IT provides a path to real empowerment. Advocacy for the use of IT in promoting Africa-Caribbean relations and advancement should be mindful of how globalization as a movement threatens the local context. Without a doubt, post-colonial societies must give critical attention to the role of international politics and ideologies competing against local culture in the selection, designing, and consumption of technology. Cultural awareness must be exercised in the selection of images in these societies so as to avoid the embracing of universalizing images that do not consider the specific identities and cultural boundaries. Similarly, disparaging images that perpetuate or reinforce negative and stereotypical perceptions of Africa, the Caribbean, and their inhabitants need to be eliminated from social media and other forms of IT. This is the case, not just for outsiders, but also for those within the regions who have embraced diminishing and otherizing images of people in the Caribbean and Africa. Educators can be encouraged to create their own programs, images, and icons that students can relate to, and ones that will foster consciousness raising and the development of important skills of problem solving, critical thinking, and collaborative work. Finally, IT holds immense potential to transform education and advance advocacy for the strengthening of relations between Africa and the Caribbean and in enabling both regions to face the challenges of the future. Embracing this technology requires addressing existing challenges through sustained efforts by ensuring equitable access investing in teacher training, and promoting culturally relevant content. We can leverage the power of IT to unlock the potential of all learners and help them to participate in the process of creating solutions for the future. IT should be fully accessed, utilized to transform education, transform societies in the Caribbean and Africa, for the benefit, upliftment, emancipation, and empowerment of our nations. I would. I would now like to introduce Mrs. Nicole Case, who.
who is an accomplished technology professional with over 20 years of experience leading technology initiatives across manufacturing, distribution, and financial services organizations. Mrs. Case is the Chief Information Officer with the Grace Kennedy Group. I now invite you to do your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It is indeed a pleasure to be here to share with you Grace Kennedy's technology and innovation experience. So the first thing is, who is Grace Kennedy? Grace Kennedy is a 102 years, year old company, resident here in Jamaica. We started out as a small trading company back in 1922. We now stand as a multinational conglomerate headquartered right here in Jamaica with two major divisions, food services, which we are mostly known for, as well as financial services. We currently earn US $1 billion at the end of 2023, which is a major accomplishment for a Jamaican company. So of course, with 122 years of experience, sorry, 102 years of experience, we, we have a lot to share. And innovation has been a major foundation of Grace Kennedy and that has led us to be a sustainable company right here in Jamaica. So what is innovation to GK? Innovation for us is about renewing ourselves, always looking for new ways to serve our customers, coming up with new products. We have also recognized that innovation requires transformation, and transformation typically requires technology. They both go hand in hand. One of the things we have also learned is innovation for us means that our customer must be at the center of all of our strategies around innovation. It's not about the profits. It's not about you know, um, looking good. It's really around trying to perfect the way we deliver services to our customers. So let me share a few of our technology, um, technology, journey, our technology journey for over the last two, the year 2000. So we have quite a bit to share, so I'll walk you through quite a bit of it. So in 2004, we would have started out serving our customers offering Bill Express services in one of our subsidiaries. And we decided that we needed to offer more convenient bill services to our customers. And so we journeyed into offering online bill payment. We were the first to do this. It was quite innovative at the time. And what we have seen is incrementally each year to date, we continue to see growth in our community leveraging these types of services. In 2016, our foods division recognized that for us to grow and sustain our operations, we had to invest in significant technology to bring all our data together. And we, we made our first major investment in a technology solution called SAP. And that allowed us to integrate all of our manufacturing retail distribution operations, and that has continued to be the foundation of our growth across all of our various countries. In 2010, one of our other subsidiaries, First Global Bank, would have joined the community of serving online banking. But we didn't want to just bring online banking the way the other banks did. We were the first to allow our customers to do online wire transfers, and transfers in between banks. Again, in our 
general insurance company, GK General, we were also the first in 2015 to offer online general insurance. So our customers were able to register their vehicles and procure motor vehicle insurance right from the comfort of their home, collecting their motor vehicle certificates without leaving their bed. Quite groundbreaking. And I must say, I utilize this service myself. <laughs> <laughs> Again, in the same year, another groundbreaking implementation that we championed in the banking sector is that we implemented, and we were the first in the Caribbean actually, to implement what, what is called video teller machines, which is basically an ATM service that actually leverages a real life teller. So, not only are you doing regular ATM transactions, you are able to actually interact with a person. And we found that many persons who didn't, they were afraid of using the ATM. They really adopted the utilization of this service by talking to a human being. And that service is still one of our most active tellers in our operation to this date. So again, in 2016, Again, in the banking field, we implemented Visa debit cards. I mean, many of these things are like the norm now for us. But at, in those days, it was really groundbreaking because talking about using your, your debit card, at that time, we were using our debit cards to withdraw cash, to go to the supermarket, and maybe pay for a transaction. When we implemented the debit card, we were able to actually now use your debit card and purchase Trans, do transactions online. So there came the advent of Amazon and utilizing our cards to get all obsessed with Amazon. In 2017, we had another groundbreaking implementation and this was our first journey into what we call mobile money. So GKMP was our first mobile wallet product. You may say, hmm, never heard of that, why? It didn't work. So one of the things you learn with innovation, it doesn't always work. But for us, no implementation is a complete failure. There's always a lesson to be learned. And believe me, we researched to death why this didn't work. And we garnered tremendous insights. And that has actually led us to what you'll see what we're doing now that started in 2022. So in 2020 and 2021, that was a very critical period for us. What was happening at that time? COVID-19. So one of the things we recognize is that COVID-19 brought about one of the most transformative periods in technology because all the persons who were afraid of using online banking, all the persons who never dreamt that they would go to an ATM, all now prefer to utilize technology. So we saw uh, exponential growth in persons utilizing a number of our online services. Interestingly, we always say success is when opportunity meets preparation. The reality is because we have always had a thrust of bringing online and digital solutions for our customers, we were really able to respond to a number of the needs of our customers. And in 2020, we transformed our remittance services by allowing our customers to go online, register to collect their Western Union remittances, and send them directly to their bank account. So no longer did they have to go to a Western Union location, stand up in the crowd amongst persons that they didn't want them to breathe on them in this COVID era, and utilize this online service. Now, if we didn't have that in the pipeline prior to COVID, there's no way we would have been able to realize that opportunity. Likewise, in our food division, because we had it on our journey, we were going to offer online grocery shopping for Hilo. Believe me, this is one of those areas that customer adoption is quite difficult. COVID-19, immediate adoption, because everyone wanted to purchase their groceries online. And there came our Hilo e-commerce app. I still use this service to date. What we have found is 
after COVID, many persons went back to going to the supermarket because you want to feel your products and you want to do so and so. But the reality is it does provide a tremendous amount of convenience for a number of our customers. And one of the things it showed us is that even though you may innovate and provide new services and new ways to do business, it's important to also recognize that your, your previous channels that you have may not be obsolete and you have to strike a balance between how you manage the opportunity of both channels. So taking us to 2022, we would have launched what would have been one of Grace Kennedy's most groundbreaking innovations. And what's different about this innovation over all of what we had done in the years prior? So Grace Kennedy always invested in technology and always had a focus on innovation. One of the things we had learned is, and we asked ourselves, are you giving it enough focus? You know, it's quite a huge operation, and you always have decisions to make as to how to invest. Are you going to invest in the things that you must do to keep the doors open? And oftentimes, that's quite costly, and you don't focus on investing on innovation. And you have a set amount of resources across the organization, and it's quite a difficult decision. So we recognized that when we developed our long-term strategy for 2030, that we have to have a more significant investment in innovation. And through great leadership and insight, we implemented what we call a digital factory. A digital factory for Grace Kennedy was a complete operation dedicated to digital innovation. And our GK1 app is the first product that has come out. Our GK1 app is actually a super app that is going to be the building of Grace Kennedy's digital ecosystem, offering numerous services across all of the different areas of Grace Kennedy. And we launched this product in 2022, offering a remittance product that allowed our customers to collect their remittances directly to a prepaid card. Now for our consumers, that was groundbreaking because our customer base is quite varied. Our customers in this market includes customers with bank accounts, customers who do not want bank accounts, and it's you know financial inclusion and educating them on how to use these products and what these products can do for you. What we also found is that we had a number of our customers who they had a fear of being in the main banking system. And this product allowed them to feel a part of our financial ecosystem without being a part of a bank. Our, this product has grown and has become one of the largest channels for this service at Grace Kennedy Money Services. It continues to grow and each year our digital factory rolls out new products. We are also offering on that platform that you can onboard and get a credit card from First Global Bank, all from the comfort of your home. And we will continue this investment to continue to serve our customers um, digitally through, digi through technology innovation. So what are some of the key drivers of technology and innovation? These are some of the key things that we have learned. And in the interest of time, I won't go through all of them. But I'll just state one of the main things that we have learned, as I said earlier, having the customer at the center of your innovation is key. What that means is data analytics has become one of the foundation tools that we need to ensure that we truly understand our customers. How else are you going to know what your customers want unless you harness that data and really understand what are their preferences, how they're doing business with you, and what are their needs and their future needs. We have made, we have made a tremendous investment in this, and we have used that to guide us in de developing new products and creating new innovations. One of the other things that I will point out is the use of cloud technology. So our ability to roll out new solutions also means that we have to do it quickly to respond to 
all of the needs in the marketplace. If you are not able to do it quickly, you may lose the opportunity and the window is gone. Leveraging cloud technology to build these solutions has been quite instrumental for us. Our GK1 app is 100% cloud-based, and we have been able to scale up rapidly with the rapid growth and adoption that we have seen with the product. We would not have been able to do that if we had gone with more traditional technologies. Another key thing that we have started to utilize and look at even more is the use of robotics and artificial intelligence. Um, we have leveraged a lot of robotics in the background to automate a number of the processes with our apps that we're offering to our customers. And we have started to utilize artificial intelligence to ensure that we are offering secure solutions. So security is also at the top of ensuring that we're offering solid technology. So what are some of the key pillars of technology innovation that we have learned? It starts with leadership. You must have the right leader in place to drive and support the culture of innovation needed for you to sustain innovation in your organization. This means a leader who will believe in the future of innovation and a leader who will back the funds necessary to get it done because this is, not, this is quite a costly endeavor for any company or any entity. In addition, we have learned ensuring that our people have the capabilities. That has been a challenge when we started our digital factory. We had to contract a number of the technical skills from outside of Jamaica. I'm happy to say that we recognized that we needed to invest more in leveraging our own local talent on our factories now 100% Jamaican employed technologists. Another thing that we have learned is that we must focus on being high tech. We cannot be afraid of new technology. We must modernize constantly and we must be ready to implement new features. And of course, as I mentioned, innovation requires transformation and transformation means that you must be masters of change management. In any new thing that you're planning to implement, there will always be stakeholders who are resistant to change. And therefore, your leaders, your employees, must be cognizant of the skills to counteract that and ensure that we communicate effectively to make that investment a success. So I will close with just highlighting two, a few key opportunities for Africa and the Caribbean. And I'm taking it from two perspectives. From a government and regulatory perspective, there is an opportunity to ensure that countries leverage and facilitate some economies of scale that will really facilitate innovation in your countries. Customer, we said the customer is the center. What that means as well is that we must be able to identify your customers and to identify them digitally. So regulators can look at opportunities to ensure, for example, that your IDs are all electronic, your driver's license, your passports, any form of identification needs to have an electronic component so that we can ensure that when you're in the electronic space, you know exactly who you are transacting with. The other aspect is mobile and internet accessibility. No country without, solid, without a solid internet backbone will thrive in the online space if the service is unreliable. It is imperative that our regulators ensure the right level of stability so that we are able to thrive in the, more, in the online community. Lastly, regulations for security, cybersecurity, and data protection. This is critical. When you have companies implementing technology solutions, it's important that customers recognize that they're safe. And it's quite expensive to remain safe. And without the proper laws and penalties, there's no guarantee that the technology providers are actually giving you safe solutions. And this is where our regulators come in. Lastly, recommendations for companies. 
invest in innovation. You need to be focused about investing in innovation. It requires tremendous discipline and tremendous commitment and resources and funding. If you do not innovate, you will not thrive. Without innovation, Grace Kennedy would not be where we are today, and we're here to show, and as a testimony to the fact that we would have died if we had not made many of the investments we had over the years. Another key element, build the capabilities to innovate. These are new and they're constantly changing. Our education system needs to keep up with the technology and the skills that we need. And lastly, I will say, leverage your data. Data is gold for any company. And you're harnessing and sitting on a pot of gold that you may not even recognize because there is so much insights that you can gain from harnessing what your customers have told you but you have yet to realize. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. I'm sure you will agree with me that that was an amazingly interesting presentation because our eyes were opened. We learned so much about Grace Kennedy and what happens before we see all these packages and cans on, on the shelves all over the, the, the world, all over the world. Um, thank you so much. I, I found it very, to be very engaging. We, we are going to have to make a slight change in our program. Um, interestingly, due to technological challenges in this session. <laughs> but we are going to take the presentation by Dr. Didikos Jules. And I'd like to introduce him, starting with his chairmanship of the Caribbean Examinations Council, which is where I met him years ago. But he has had extensive regional and international experience, served as the chief executive officer of the CXC, leading it through modernization. He has served as vice president of human resources with Cable and Wireless St. Lucia, and a permanent secretary for education and human resource development in St. Lucia, as well as permanent secretary, secretary in Revolutionary Grenada from 1981 to 1983. Um, Dr. Jules now serves as the Director General of the OECS and as the Information Technology and Innovation Opportunities for Partnerships. No, he's the Director General of the OECS, and he will speak to the topic Innovation, Technology, and Information Opportunities for Partnerships. Dr. Jules. With the protocol already established, let me extend greetings to esteemed guests, policymakers, educators, and innovators. It is indeed a privilege to speak at a forum of this caliber on the instigation of bearers of light such as the Right Honorable P.J. Patterson and His Excellency the Most Honorable Professor Kenneth Hall on a subject that resonates with the transformative power of our age. The rapid advances in information technology are having a profound and exponential impact on virtually all domains of our lives. These technologies provide boundless opportunities for Africa and the Caribbean to make a transformational development leap. It has been said that art prefigures life, and those who may have seen the blockbuster movie The Black Panther, which fictionally depicted the rise of African civilization in Wakanda, utilizing technology and innovation unknown in the rest of the world. We stand at the crossroads of an era marked by remarkable technological evolution in XR, extended reality, which ranges from augmented reality, AR, through mixed reality, MR, to virtual reality, VR, with huge potential for the incorporation of artificial intelligence. 
As we know, augmented reality augments our surroundings by adding or overlaying digital elements to a live view. Mixed reality is the blend of the physical and real world with digital or virtual elements, where physical and digital elements can interact. On the other extreme, virtual reality is a totally immersive digital experience that engulfs us in a simulated environment. These technologies are not just reshaping the landscapes of developed nations, but hold the promise of driving significant change in developing regions, bringing us to the cusp of a new dawn for Africa and the Caribbean. Allow me to delve into how VR and AR are paving the way for revolutionary changes in education. Imagine students in remote areas of Africa and the Caribbean diving into immersive learning experiences. Imagine walking through historical sites like Nelson's Dockyard, Mount Pele, Brimstone Hill, and all the World Heritage sites in the region, and stepping back in time through augmented reality to experience the sights and sounds of their heyday. Imagine also conducting complex scientific experiments virtually, or exploring the human body on a journey through the arteries to view the functioning of all organs. These technologies can bridge gaps in educational resources and access, lighten a spark of curiosity and learning in young minds, irrespective of their geographical locations. In healthcare, VR's potential to train medical professionals provides a beacon of hope. It offers a solution to the shortage of healthcare workers by simulating real life medical procedures for training purposes, thus enhancing the quality of healthcare in local places. The potential of AR to transform tourism and cultural preservation is practically unlimited, offering interactive experiences that enrich visitors' understanding and appreciation of historical and cultural heritage, contributing to economic growth and the safeguarding of our rich histories. Turning our focus now to artificial intelligence, its application in agriculture presents a game-changing opportunity for food security and sustainability. Through predictive ana analytics and monitoring, AI can lead to more efficient farming practices, higher yields, and a reduction in resource waste, ensuring that Africa and the Caribbean move towards self-sufficiency and resilience in food production. In the realm of healthcare, AI's role in diagnostics, personalized treatment, and predictive health and analytics can significantly enhance the quality and accessibility of healthcare services. For a region challenged by healthcare access, AI solutions, including telemedicine and mobile health apps, can make a substantial difference. In rural areas or isolated islands where medical facilities and specialists are scarce, AI-enabled telemedicine platforms can facilitate remote consultations. So, for example, an AI system can analyze medical images such as x-rays or dermatological photos, and provide preliminary diagnosis, enabling local healthcare providers to consult with specialists in urban centers or even internationally, ensuring timely and informed treatment decisions. Furthermore, the integration of AI in financial services heralds a new era of inclusion and security. One of the primary barriers to financial inclusion for the unbanked is the lack of a formal credit history, which traditional banks require for loan approvals. AI can address this issue by using alternative data sources such as mobile phone usage patterns, bill payments, and even social media activity to assess an individual's credit worthiness. By analyzing these data points, AI models can generate credit scores for individuals who have been invisible to the traditional bank, financial and banking system, enabling them to access loans and other financial services. 
microloan and peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms. By automating the risk assessment and loan distribution process, can offer small loans to the unbanked with reasonable interest rates. This access to credit not only helps individuals in immediate financial need, but also supports entrepreneurs in starting and expanding small businesses, fostering economic growth and job creation in their communities. However, to fully harness the potential of these technologies, a concerted effort is needed from all stakeholders. Policymakers must prioritize the development of digital infrastructure, ensure affordable internet access, promote digital literacy, and create a regulatory environment that nurtures innovation while safeguarding privacy and security. Collaboration between governments, international tech companies, educational institutions, and nonprofits will be pivotal in transferring technology and building local capacities. By embracing these technologies, Africa and the Caribbean can not only address local challenges, but also propel themselves onto the global stage as leaders in innovation-driven development. In conclusion, the future is ripe with possibilities. As we navigate this digital revolution, let us seize these opportunities to transform the lives of our citizens, fostering an environment where technology serves as a bridge to prosperity, inclusion, and a brighter future for Africa and the Caribbean. I thank you. I want to thank Dr. Didicus Jules for that very illuminating presentation and for how it spans so many areas in his attempt to demonstrate to us how the harnessing of digital infrastructure can provide solutions to so many areas of our lives, healthcare, um, credit scores, banking, entrepreneurship, and so on. Um, this is certainly a symposium, symposium in which we are all learning a lot, and at this moment about information technology. He's not on. You don't think you'll have him, he will come in at all. Okay, um, the ironies of life. So while we are here learning about all kinds of wonderful innovations in the field of information technology, we are also seeing how some of the challenges that all of us feel, we have some face, we have some of those challenges in the Caribbean when we attempt to do this kind of online um, presentation and so on. But it, it serves to reinforce what we've been saying that stakeholders, policymakers, people with wealth who have an interest in improving connectivity issues in the Caribbean and across the African continent, you know, need to prioritize issues related to information technology. Um, perhaps rather, as I said, when I spoke over some of the, what they consider to be well-meaning um, agendas and, and projects, um, because um, information systems, information technology, as we are talking about specifically, has such an all-encompassing um, effect on our lives. And the, those two main issues, the connectivity issues and the training of, of people, the, the training in terms of some of the phobias with which people um, face the technology and, and training um, in terms of the actual technicians and engineers and people with the skills to, to use the technology needs pe need people who will be um, prepared to invest um, generously in these areas. So we come now to 
the question and answer um, session, and I'd like to invite you to direct your questions to, so you will get many questions <laughs> to, to Mrs. Nicole Case from Grace Kennedy. Any questions? All right, great, thank you very much. All right, um, so Dr. Jules mentioned the use of AI technology. And when we started out this morning, we got a charge um, in terms of debt elimination strategies and sustainable GDP. And I am seeing the opportunity for a synergy between the AI technology and solving the debt problem that, we, that was identified in segment one. Um, the other, and you can expound on that um, as well. The, the second point is the AI strategies, given that we are now embarking or the need to embark on corrective climate change strategies, how can we utilize AI in that respect? Thank you. Are you asking Dr. Taylor to come back and answer that question? <laughs> because. <laughs> Testing, okay. Wow, that's a very heavy one. So let me start with AI. You mentioned AI and in respect to. Climate. No, she started oh, with, with debt reduction. Okay. Debt reduction. Okay, so that's a tough one because I'm not a specialist in debt reduction. What I will say is that AI allows us the opportunity to automate decision making and to generate and harness large volumes of information well beyond the capacity of the human brain. So logically, the assumption would be if we have large amounts of data not only are we using our traditional statistical tools to analyze and look for insights, but you can also leverage AI to start making human-like decision-making based on the information that you're parsing. So all of that is the opportunity. And as I even mentioned, the use of data, it's gold. It's what we do with it, right? So there is an opportunity to leverage these new technologies to give us new insights in that area. And I will segue quite similarly, I'm not an expert in climate change, but again, if we harness our climate change information in large, with large volumes of data, we can get better at predictive analysis, as mentioned by Dr. Taylor, right? And in doing so, we can be better prepared, and we can be better prepared to budget recovery strategies and align. So this is a way that we can use technology to manifest improvement in all of our operations. Thank you very much, Mrs. Case. Uh, Professor Taylor is going to address that question. I think you are, are right. The ways that, so this is one of the big nexus areas now, um, big data, AI, yes. and the climate change. And it is seen as one of the avenues for, for example, small islands to gain resilience. And, and it is really on the premise that AI can allow for detection of things much earlier and for that kind of decision making. So for example, ways that are we, we know we are exploring right now in Jamaica, how can we use AI to tell a drought is happening way before we have to spot that a drought is happening? And it's, if you just think about it, you, you take satellite pictures of forestry and green and you can detect detect when shades of green change even before we can detect? Or how do you use it for resilience um, to deal with infrastructure and detect, for example, flaws in bridges or roads um, before they become? Or early warning again for systems and that kind of thing. It is one of the big nexus areas now between climate change and, and resilience. Um, so. And we're beginning to work on some of those issues. Um, in one second, um, Dr. Jules would like to respond. 
Okay. Didikas, we have you on, on, we're using technology. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Go ahead. I, I thought I did actually. I think I have to call him back. We, we are. Yeah, go, try now. Okay. Yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. Did it go? You can speak. So, <clears throat> yes, first of all, I want to apologize. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. I want to apologize for not being physically present. Um, but that last question was very interesting, and I wanted to add another dimension to the responses already very eloquently given by Professor and the, the lady from Grace Kennedy. Um, one of the, the intriguing things about artificial intelligence for me is the opportunity it gives us, as indicated, for analyzing massive data sets. Yeah, analyzing massive data sets that makes it possible for us. Yes, I want to apologize for not being physically present. Um, but that last question was very interesting, and I wanted to add another dimension to the responses. Already very eloquent by Professor um, One of the intriguing things of artificial intelligence for me is the opportunity it gives us as educated for analyzing. Did it cause? You may have to record and send it to us. The other dimension to this is that the data sets that we, that we are able to bring together don't necessarily have to be obviously related to each other. So it then makes it possible to use demographic data, spatial data, um, seemingly unrelated data to, to concretize it. Let us imagine, for example, in education, we want to, we look at the socioeconomic background of students, their performance in education, in examinations, for example, or the general education performance, and we look at their nutritional status. Perhaps through artificial intelligence, we will discover connections that we do not know exist. Is there a relationship between nutritional status of students and their performance in, in school, their learning capacity, the speed at which they learn. So the ability, and the, the, the good thing about it too is that for us as human analysts, we always come with a predisposition to data um, based on our backgrounds, our prejudices, our in interests, specific interests, and our own assumptions. Having really solid data sets and having artificial intelligence interpolate those data sets allows us to do that without the element of human prejudice. Now, it would be interesting to see how that works out in real life applications and the types of solutions that are being recommended purely based on the analytics and the algorithms of the data, some of which may be invisible to us because we don't see the interconnections. And I think that ultimately is the real value of artificial intelligence in this application in many fields of human endeavor. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I want to say thank you for this session and to the um, Institute for having this and particular discussion on climate change. Um, Prof. Dr. Didikas Jews, I was deeply impressed by your presentation and my question is directly to you and possibly Professor Taylor as well. Um, I, you know, just the idea of having our people being immersed in Nelson's dockyard, 
and being in, in Antigua and being here in Jamaica is incredible. Um, as an architect, I have been watching the environment around us change. And um, it is important, as Professor Taylor says, that we have the big data that would help us to predict where floods are going to occur. They are regularly occurring. But what is happening as we examine the landscape, we see that the AI and the data is actually generating designs for the environment. Buildings are popping up in all kinds of strange places without the big data analysis. So um, as we look at this information, the technology that is being used in the banking and all these kind of places, um, my question is, um, how do you see the African and the Caribbean landscape that would begin to um, collaborate in a way and leverage some of those funding internationally? You mentioned that initially you had to go overseas at Grace to get the technology and the people here, and now you have trained. Um, so in the same way, how can we begin to leverage this to begin to train the Caribbean and the African to recognize the indigenous, um, sustainable development of the landscape and the architecture that we have had historically, as opposed to importing um, higher carbon footprints in our nation and building um, AI designs in our Caribbean and African landscape, which um, increase and intensify climate change issues. So it's a big question. I'm excited by your presentation of the Colosseum in Greece and people walking in and out and the whole idea of this. But how do we come together as a region that has its own environment that has worked sustainably and historically. I heard this from Professor Bogues when he spoke, and we are now beginning to adapt some of this technology. Are we writing the AI programs, and are we providing the data, the big data, for these analysis? Thank you. Okay, I suppose all questions do not have to, were you going to answer? I was going to say questions can be posed and they present a wonderful opportunity for us to go and do the research and continue the interrogation. Yes. Um, I think Mrs. Case may have something to add. I just have a few thoughts. Um, it's a very interesting question and really thought provoking. Um, I believe when I look at uses of data and whether or not data needs to be central or decentralized and where do we need to have these skill sets. Now, you know, traditionally there are specialized areas who don't think of themselves as technologists and they don't think of the data that they have in their industry as being specialized data per se. And it really now requires that all of the different areas that influence climate change, geologists, I mean, I don't know all of the disciplines, but all of the different areas, if we have a focus on technology and harnessing and protecting data and gathering and storing the data, the technology can be leveraged because the technology is what may be similar across all the industries. What is going to be unique is the data and making sure that data is accurate and valuable. And it requires skill sets. So, you know, when you talk about the paradigm of should it be decentralized or centralized, um, it's a very difficult one. And to be honest with you, you can have an entire symposium to answer the question that has been posed in reality. Because there are many different ways that you can look at it. But one thing that I would say is at the core of it is that 
each area that is not considered traditionally a technology area need to become technology savvy. You, you cannot have manual data, manual sheets, pictures, everything needs to be digitized. That is your building block. Once you have that, you are now creating the opportunity to leverage technology and utilize AI to solve bigger problems. It also then creates the opportunity for you to talk across industries and share information across industries and really harness data, new insights and come up with new innovations. So that would be my, my thought on the matter. Mm -hmm. Did you have a question? I'm going to ask you to make it a question. Please, a short question, not a long statement. Thank All you. Right. Good day, everyone. So my background is in communications, behavior change, and cultural communication. So my question is um, linked to that. I wanted to ask it earlier, but I'll try to meet the linkage with technology. Because one of the things I've realized when we speak a lot about bridging the gap between Africa and Caribbean state is how to include the youth voices. Uh, this is probably my second ses session in this room, and I've noticed it tends to be lots of persons from academia. And so I wanted to ask a question in terms of how we can even utilize these digital technologies to ensure that we're engaging young people in seeing the importance and the benefits of the connections between African and Caribbean states. It's one thing when academia buys in, but if we are to make steady and sustainable progress, it is recommended that we're starting with the younger persons for them to see the benefit of this. So I'm not a tech specialist. What I am good at is communication and marketing and connecting all the dots from Jamaica and elsewhere. But what I want to ask the tech persons is how can we be leveraging these technologies to ensure that we're getting the buy-in? And I would go a little wider, not just youth, yeah. but the general populace. Because we who are in here, we're convinced. The academic community is convinced, but we need to take it a little bit wider. Uh, testing. Okay, thank you for that question. Um, interestingly, um, one of the things about innovation is a skill set about leveraging cross-functional teams to really collaborate effectively. And when I think about it, sometimes in our school system, the way that we are educating the youth, we are not crossing the dots across the different specializations. And the reality is, when it comes to technology, when, I, when you li listen to the question that I answered before, technology is a building block for collaboration. So if in our school environments, for example, we are teaching our students to collaborate and use technology across all of their disciplines, then it becomes easier for them to adopt technology as a building block for everything and keeping them, and so when you talk about um, climate change and data and all of these insights, you're right. Perhaps we should have a younger audience participating here and being a part of the discourse. And that, in my opinion, would be a good building block. But in addition to that, we could also ensure mm -hmm. that within our school systems, that the way that we're teaching our students about technology, about innovation, about change management, and how to handle transformation. Start building those building blocks with the youths in the way that, they're, or the way that we are dispensing education and executing different projects. Um, those would be my insights. I don't know if I fully answered your question, but it's more of an opinion. Um, can I, thank you very much. Can I just add to that very quickly that just at, at a, you may call it a simple level, this event is being live streamed, so it's accessible, it's available to a wide audience. Um, and our um, tech-savvy young people know how to find everything once it is being live streamed anywhere. Believe me, our UWE students know how to access UWE TV. Information, anything that's done on UWE TV, for instance, is repeated numerous times, so they can always um, ac access it. Um, there was something else I was going to say, but I've forgotten. <laughs> okay. Dr. Jules has a response as well to the question on architecture. Didikas, Dr. Jules, please go ahead. Just, I can tell you, you may call it a simple lesson. This event is like... I 
Yeah. With, with respect to this question of as the issue is earlier about climate change and architecture and so on, I think the power of AI is its predictive capacity, the ability to tell us when, where, and to what extent climatic events may occur. So it gives us the ability to be more responsive to and therefore be in a better disaster preparedness mode. They are also, it can all, that, that, that analytics can also help us to design new models of architecture that are climate resist, resist, resistant in also a predictive and anticipatory manner. With respect to AI leveraging environmental data, it also could be used to help with design, new design principles based on what the data is predicting about where climate change is likely to go and help us also to incorporate landscaping principles. So consider data related to the morphology of the particular geography that we exist in and all of the climate data relating to the dangers and what is likely to happen in different scenarios can now become part of what goes into the design of new forms of architecture that are more sensitive to the environment. The question was also raised about cultural elements. And I think AI also enables us to incorporate cultural elements, ancestral knowledge into what we do. So for example, we see in Africa, um, many m traditional African housing is always circular in its formation. Is there something there that can tell us something about a new architecture that is well suited to the geography of these parts of Africa, to the climatic conditions and so on, that would mean a new form of architecture for housing that may perhaps deal with the increasing heat, heat waves in the coming out, arising from climate change or other issues. Regarding the issue of the youth voices, the, the person who spoke to that was very correct. We cannot undertake this AI revolution without young people being at the forefront of it mm -hmm. because they are the best interlocutors in this effort. Um, just recently, we launched the OECS Robotics Association in St. Kitts and Nevis, and that constitute, that brings together some of the, the brightest young people in the OECS who are deeply involved, not just in robotics tradition. They call themselves a robotics association, but ultimately we use them as an OECS innovation association and these young people are doing some of the most amazing things we've had for example um, a young person in the OECS develop a, an AI chatbot that will be incorporated in our OECS website that anybody wanting to ask questions about OECS integration can ask those questions and get the responses through a chatbot that will surf the website and all the news items that we've released on OECS integration and provide them with a succinct summation um, answer to the question that they are asking. And that's just only one example of what is happening. We've had young people develop um, things like there's a, a, an application that has been developed for, for marine transportation across the OECS. And this is not some of the, the shipping companies, the, the, the ferry companies, in especially up in the northern eastern Caribbean, have their own dedicated websites where you can book and pay online. But this one is a ferry, a company agnostic site. It is a site you go on and you can plan your entire trip using re uh, registrations from multiple multiple companies and pay online, see the times, the hours they arrive, the entire thing can be done totally online and span in many companies. So it's really uh, an, an, an ideal site to, to do, to handle effective transportation by marine, by marine um, ferries across the OECS. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to respond to um, Shanoi Coombs' his question as well. I know we're crossing across questions here, um, but from the university's perspective, I will say uh, a number of things. First of all, we acknowledge that young people are more tech savvy than we are. 
So I think that it's, uh, it's, it's appropriate that the certain age group is in this room because we have to buy into it. They're already bought into it. Uh, secondly, part of the um, education structure, certainly that, that's here at the, the university, and I know this operates on an international and a global level, is that we have what's called collaborative international online learning. So there is that integration that allows for a cross-disciplinary approach in relation to various issues. We also have, um, as a result of COVID being, a, I'm going to say, a positive change, it forced us into using both synchronous online learning and obviously now asynchronous online learning. Blending. So I would say that technology has certainly um, includes the young people, and I think that they're way ahead than many of us are, certainly in this room. So thank you. Oh, definitely. And the way um, information technology has changed so much in the university, in the landscape of the university. So our students are forced to always be engaged with at every aspect of their university life, registration, choosing of courses, and so on. But one important thing that we need to say is that one of the thrusts of the institute going forward is to develop a program in the schools to have a sort of consciousness raising program where we get the young people in the school to understand um, what Africa is really about to help them to, to, to help to explode some of the myths that they've grown up, they've become accustomed to hearing, and they've they have accepted. So that is part of the, the plan. I, I suspect that that is something that you would want to hear. But that is very much in the, in the plans. And when Mr. Patterson spoke, he spoke about the exchange programs that we have with a number of universities in, um, in, on the African continent. Um, I think that this is where I should say thank you very much for your enthusiasm, your participation, and I want to thank the presenters. Thank you for being so generous with your ideas, with your knowledge, and now we, we well, I certainly was not aware of the many, many services that Grace Kennedy offered, right? So <laughs> now I will be looking at Grace uh, uh, with, you know, a, a little more scrutinizing Grace a little more. Let me invite Professor Bogues to now come to the podium to close the session. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Um, I, I was given the task uh, to open up and to, and to sum up. So I'm going to try and sum up um, uh, as briefly as possible. Uh, I think it is safe to say that at the core of this conference were the following things. Firstly, a discussion um, led firstly uh, by uh, Prime Minister Motley around the ways in which uh, Africa and the African diaspora has been constructed through what she called historical injustice. And that the ways in which, therefore, the legacies, and all the speakers um, in the first session referred to this, the legacy of that in historical injustice of slavery and racial slavery and colonialism uh, continues today and, and, and structured within a global system, which operates today. And therefore, that one of the th things that constitutes any collaboration between Africa and the Caribbean is really, as she puts it, a moral uh, imperative. Uh, second thing that I think came up is, um, then all of this, because this morning talked about it, is that, to do, that this moral imperative really um, means a long walk. Um, and uh, this is, we are in a long journey. Um, you know, uh, Professor Beckles talked about what the 19th century did, what the 20th century um, did, and that what we might be able to do in the 21st. So this is a, a long j journey. But I would argue that it is a journey with a certain destination. It's not a journey of just expectation, um, which is how some, some of the Caribbean writers would put it. But it's a journey with destination. And that destination, I would argue, is around business of freedom and a different kind of world that we 
uh, that we live in, and that these things are actually uh, possible. The other third thing I would want to say is that, that, have, that emerged is that there is the idea, I think, of us having to rethink what development looks like and collaboration. And that, it, and that to do that requires, quite frankly, political will. And this, I think, is really important. I'm speaking as a person who thinks that politics is perhaps the most important public good of the human species. That, they, that you can't begin to do things. You can't begin to implement pot projects. You can't begin to talk about exchanges of people. You can't begin to do a whole host of things until you actually develop the political will to do this. And that political will is not just the political will of the leadership and the people in the state, but actually the political will of the ordinary person, him or herself. And so that therefore to think about that, I think, and to see how one can mobilize that political will, I think is extremely important. At the heart of the mobilization of that political will, I think it's a question of education. I spoke about the 50% that each of us know about each other. You'll be surprised when you talk to Caribbean people when they think of Africa. As someone who visits Africa, who was a professorship in, in, in an African university, you kind of have to hang your head in shame, right? Because of, and that, that is around the question, actually, quite frankly, of blackness and how we think about blackness, and how we think that we ourselves are different from these people. And that has a long history in this region. It has a long history when they began to, when they, the British colonists began to think about the scramble for Africa from 1884, 1885. One of the most important texts was a text produced in the Caribbean, which began to talk about that we in the Caribbean were Creole Negroes while they weren't. And because we were Creole Negroes, because we had had a long time with the white people, with the Europeans, and, we are, and they therefore understood us, and we understood them. But these Africans didn't. And so that one of the things that, have, that, that we, that in terms of the education, is that it has to go both ways. It has to have, the Africans have to think about the African diaspora itself, and we have to think about what does Africa constitute? Not just an imaginary of, of, of Africa, which is what we have. Because one of the, you know, it's, and I just, if I could just say something here. One of the things that struck me, and you talk about young people, I was at a conference in Senegal about six, eight months ago. And I asked that I would like the conference to end with young people, with young DJs and young poets dub poets, to come and talk about their lives. And it, to me, it was the most interesting um, session of this meeting with all academic historians and philosophers and theorists. And when I asked the young people, who were the influences in their lives? Rastafari, Malcolm X, Marcus Garvey. Right? And I was just taken aback. Okay? And I said, what do you understand about these things? They had explanations which I, you know, said, well, not quite so. But what, but that didn't, re what that didn't matter to me. What mattered was that they knew names and they had an understanding and were being inspired by certain things. And so, uh, and they, and they also knew through the music, quite frankly, that the Jamaica. They could tell me where in Jamaica they had come to record. And then I said to myself, well, okay, there is a linkage here that we academics and policymakers all pay attention to. And that linkage is when the people them just get up and say, I have to go to Jamaica to go and record in the Tough Gong studio or the studio on Marcus Garvey Drive. And who they meet and what they do and how they think about these things, right? So that therefore when one is thinking through all this question of cooperation. A point I made at the beginning is that you also have to think, and young people, is that you also have to think about how these young people, without state leadership, without money from people, without the big us, big people in it, decide by themselves this is what them is going to do. Because them hear something about Rasta, them hear something about Marcus, Marcus Garvey, and, and so on. The other thing I think that, is, that, that becomes, that, that is one of the things that is happening is, the, is really how to think about Haiti. And I would think that is, this, to me, is one of the most 
difficult and important issues of the world today. And that needs some kind of thinking through. Because at the heart of the Haitian question is the rehabilitation of blackness. Haiti was made, was after the revolution, the dual revolution, was not to succeed. This is what Napoleon said to the British ambassador. He said, I don't care about the commercial stuff. I don't care about the economics or the political stuff. He says, what I care about is the specter of a successful black state. The specter of a successful black state. And it is that specter of a successful black state that has driven policy in the West towards Haiti. And therefore, we have to understand, I mean, you know, we, have a, we developed a kind of thing in the Caribbean. David Rudder talked about, sang about it. We developed a thing that says what? That says, well, you know, Haitianization. I don't want to be like Haiti. All right? We all say that. I have people who come to me and say, I want to contribute to Haiti, but to take me aside and say, Tony, why them can't get them act together? Right? In a way that says, what is good, you know, not what is going on there, but what, who are these people? Right? And so that the business of, of Haiti and what it stands for, the way I like to write, the way I write about it is that there are two archives of Haiti. One archive of, about the idea of Haiti. One idea is that it is a place of zombies, of superstitions, of voodoo, and of some people, some strange people that you don't want to talk, up, talk to. The other archive is that it is an archive of black freedom. And therefore, to think about those two archives and to think about how the West has constructed a set of practices that include reparation that the Haitians have to pay, just think about it. You win your freedom. I win my freedom from this lady. I fight. I kill people. Them kill me. And then you come and sit down to me and say, you have to pay me. You have to pay me not for the land, but you have to pay for myself too. And I just free myself. Right? The in, not just the indignity of that, but the ways in which, therefore, you try and put people back in their position. Right? To talk about, therefore, black sovereignty is not a possibility. It's something that we need to think through. And we, therefore, need to think about, in CARICOM, how do we construct, a, and in Africa, how do we construct relations, and what can we do to help the Haitian people? There are some very concrete things. You cannot have a situation where we turn them back. It is not, it, to me, it is not, it, it is, you talk about moral imperative, that one cannot happen, right? Because they never turned anybody back, right? They never did. They were in danger of the United States in the 19th century, saying, we are not going to trade with you if you keep the Africans who come to you. And they never said no. The only thing that Tucson said to them, okay, what I will do is that I will stop building the ships that was going to go to Africa to stop the slave trade. And I don't think he stopped. I just think he said he would stop because he was a master diplomat. But he was made it clear that, that, the, that the Africans who landed in this place and Haiti would be able to do, would, were, were free. So we should be turning back people, in my view, from, from, this, from this place. Um, the other thing I think that has come up is, um, is, the, is this business of the, of, and, I, and I'll try and wrap up here, the, the way in which we have to think through food securities, where we have to think about agriculture, giant agriculture, and so on, uh, giant agricultural projects. But I would also like to say the way we have to think about giant creative techno technological projects. And I want to say just precisely what I mean by this. A few months ago, in South Africa, the South African film company formed an alliance with Netflix that will allow them to bypass Paramount and to be involved in streaming. When I read it, I thought to myself, we should be in that mix. 
In other words, that we should be working with, with the people in Nollywood in Nigeria and the people in South Africa to say, how do we do cinematic work? Because black culture is the culture of the world in many ways. So how do we do cinematic work? How do we make movies? How do we tell our own stories, et cetera, et cetera? And how do we do that without having to wait for the big production houses of, of Paramount and so on and so forth? And I'm not against Paramount and Metro Golden Meyer and so on, all those people. But I also think that is important if we're thinking about cooperation, is that what is our, to use the word of the economist, what is our comparative advantage? Our comparative advantage is our capacity for films and culture that we then need to think about how do we use tech the modern technologies to do this. And what that means is really important for us. We talk about Afro-Caribbean co cooperation. One of the things we might want to think about is when thinking through the culture is uh, we have to stop the quarrel between the people who do Afro-pop and the people who do dance all. None of you may not know about that. I don't, I, but I know that that way I read and uh, read all these things and look at the various music journals and so on, there's a big debate, big thing going on between the Africans who are doing Afro pop and the people who do dancehall. Which one is better? Right? Without thinking that, and, and both sides are a little difficult, without thinking that Afro pop actually comes out of a relationship to dancehall. Right? So there's something going on in the, in, in the, in going on between us where we are not thinking about a set of histories that actually connect us sometime. And so that, that is something that I think in, when trying to think about culture that we need to, that we need to think about. My other, the other thing that came out is the business of, uh, is the business of climate change. And the former Prime Minister Patterson said it to myself and um, this is uh, Beverly uh, Manley Duncan. Perhaps we have a lot of fine technical solutions. COP COP 28. Every, everywhere I think, I re, everything I read, the solutions are technical solutions are there. What we don't have is that we have not turned this into a political matter. And I don't mean politics now in the narrow party sense, as we understand it in Jamaica. I mean politics in the sense that if, the, if we don't have a set of political will that is going to do the kind of mitigation work that we are talking about, then I'm going to use a Jamaican phrase, dog nyamur supper. And so that therefore the question is how do you turn this into not a partisan political matter, but how do you turn it into a global political matter? And if you're going to turn it into a global political matter, then you, how does Africa and the Caribbean, who are the people who suffer, the region that suffers from this, how do we then set up ourselves in certain ways to begin to demand of the world certain kind of things? In other words, what is the way we can make, begin to make demands? What is the international political process that we now need to trigger to make sure that certain things happen. I would just say to you, we did it in the past. We did it in the past. There was something called at the United Nations called the Decolonization Committee that we pushed and we formed from the Caribbean and from Africa. And it is at the work of the Decolonization Committee that a lot of the liberation movements were able and in, in Africa in the 1960s, late 1960s and 1970s. Africans will tell you it was the most important national, international body because you could then say certain things at that body at UN and push forward certain things. It is that body that was able to push forward the new international economic order that then made people at the UN say, okay, we now have something that we can begin to concretely to think about. The new international economic order, which then would, was killed by Mr. Ronald Reagan at a, at, a, at a meeting in Cancun. What I think we then need to think about is, as has been saying here, is the greater coordination for, uh, uh, and for uh, what we call a developmental imperative, which also includes sharing knowledges. And I just want to say two more, some of the things that came out. Sharing knowledge, greater, um, greater um, 
a greater kind of uh, you know, coordination. Education becomes really important. Both Africa and the Caribbean spend time, a lot of time, thinking about education in the colonial grammar school type. We need, in the age of technology, to begin to think about education in the way that, ha that has to do with questions of technology and how we train people, not just that does that that does that does that does train train people to do English literature, ex African literature, no Caribbean literature, Caribbean history, and also, but also teach people to understand technology. To do what? To be able to write the programs for AI. Because I think that's the point that Patricia was making. The point is that data is not neutral. We make data. So that, therefore, who is producing the data? Right? And then, therefore, who is going to anal analyze that data to be able to give us the kind of precise solutions that we have, that we ne need for the Caribbean? My final thing is this, that the Margaret Bernal said to me at a break, that perhaps we need to think about an art exhibition between Africa and the Caribbean. And she's absolutely right. As a, way, as a way, in fact, again, to educate both sides. And I think I want to thank her for that, and I would say that that needs to happen. But I would just leave this particular wrap-up with the words of Peter Touch. No matter where you come from, once you're a black man, you're an African. Thank you all very much for this. My sister is giving me a list of, is reminding me about, I think, a list of things that we have sisters. Um, to, firstly, to, to thank all the, all the presenters, everybody, I won't mention their names. I want to thank people from the UWI TV um, in Barbados and here on campus. To, think of, to thank the UWI Marketing Communication Department, to thank the media who was here, um, to th thank the PJ Patterson's Institute uh, team of persons who, who, who worked hard to make this happen, to thank Grace very much to be a, a sponsor of this, and to thank, to thank the Office of Global Affairs and the Office, obviously, of the Vice Chancellor. And finally, really to thank all of you who have stayed here for the five or six hours to take part in this. You are the ones that make this a success. Thank you all very much and take care.